Hello and welcome to Hackaday Remoticon 2021. My name is Mike Stish. I am editor in chief of Hackaday. My name is Angie Weiss Camel, and I've had the pleasure of being the event coordinator for Remoticon this year. We have a great weekend planned, packed with live talks from 19 presenters. All of this is streaming live on YouTube with links and full details found on the conference re website remoticon.io. So Hackaday has a really long history of conferences that bring people together, people who are creating amazing hardware. And uh, our premier conference is the Hackaday Super Conference. We really wanted to have that live and in person in Pasadena this year, but with the global pandemic, we decided that it was difficult to make it a perfectly safe event. We do hope to be back with that next year, uh, but today and tomorrow, we wanted to give you as much of a live experience as possible. And, uh, in doing this, we're bringing together a bunch of different tools, which I think we've all learned are a, a little bit uh, difficult to work with. Um, one of the things that came to mind is the television pro program Mad Men, which is uh, about an advertising firm in the 1960s. They, in the last season, open up uh, another branch in California and are trying to do teleconferences between New York and California. And there's a comical moment where they just can't get anything to work. And uh, you know, you fast forward, uh, about 60 years, and we're still finding that the technology is a little bit newer, um, but some of the same problems are happening. So we just ask you to be patient with uh, the presenters and the organizers, and I think we're all going to have an amazing time. One nice thing is that if you miss a little bit of a talk, you can actually go on the YouTube live, live stream and rewind a bit. So I guess there's a, there's a bonus there. And as always, we're recording these talks and our plan is to edit them and publish them individually in the weeks to come. So anything that you might miss, you will be able to watch again. So none of this would be possible without the presenters who have spent their time and energy preparing the talks that you're going to hear today and tomorrow. So we wanna start with a big thank you to all of our presenters. We had originally planned for only one day of presentations, but we had so many excellent talk proposals that we added today's track. But even with the extra day, the scheduling is still very tight. For this reason, we're going to have a guided question and answer session for each of the keynote presentations. But for the rest of the talks, the speakers will take questions afterward in the Remoticon dash questions channel on Discord. The general Discord channel is available for everyone to socialize throughout the weekend. So uh, you can join that conversation. The link is in the YouTube description where you're watching us right now. We want to uh, make sure that this is a great opportunity for you to recharge your batteries this fall heading into the coming year. And one way that we can help everyone doing that is just by being excellent to one another. You can find a complete copy of our code of conduct for Hackaday Live events linked in the YouTube script, uh, sorry, in the description of the YouTube stream below where you're watching. 
So we're about to begin the talks in just a minute, uh, but there are two social events this evening worth planning for. At 5.15 Pacific time, the Hacker Trivia is a game show where you are the contestant. It will be played on the YouTube stream with your answers submitted via Google Forms. You can either play as an individual or as a team. If you wanna play as a team, go ahead and form those teams now, do it ahead of time. And then at 6.15 Pacific time, we'll head to gather.town uh, platform for the Bring a Hack event, where you can socialize and share your latest projects. Information on how to join that event has been sent out to all of the ticket holders and will be published on Discord. All right, so we're excited to get things underway, and I'm happy to introduce my friend Elliot Williams. He's the managing editor of Hackaday. He will be the MC for our first talk and will introduce our first keynote speaker. Hey everybody, and welcome to the 2021 Hackaday Remoticon. I'm Elliot Williams, I'm managing editor of Hackaday. This year we've got three keynotes, not one, not two, but three, and they span software, hardware, and hard science. First up today, we'll start with software, or should I say firmware? Because our speaker is Elysia White. She is an embedded engineer extraordinaire. She's written the book on it, basically. She's written Making Embedded Systems. She's held down the Embedded FM podcast for a very long time now. And we are super happy to be able to share her hard earned expertise with you to help guide you through one of the really dark corners of microcontrollers, the memory map. And so without further ado, I would like to present you Alicia White. Hi, Hey. so happy to be here and thank you for that introduction. Let me share my screen. All right, this whole Zoom thing. Do you think I'd be used to it by now? Okay, if you are not seeing what looks like the first slide in a slide deck, I don't know, none of you can talk. So here it goes. I am here to talk about map files and memory. And as Elliot said, I have a podcast and a book. I've been an embedded software engineer for a couple of decades. I have been thinking a lot lately about how we teach things. I'm working on an online course about developing embedded software professionally. And there were so many lectures. I'd start with grand ideas of explaining bootloaders and pointers and state machines. And it would all be glorious and fun, like my talk about map files. And at some point, bleary-eyed and frustrated, I would think, look, not everything can be as fascinating as map files are, which when I say it aloud sounds ridiculous. But let me share my view of memory maps with you, and then we can figure out how to make the rest of embedded systems more fun to learn and to teach. And if you don't know where a map file comes from or how it's built, stick around, we will get there. Before that, I want to show you how awesome they are and why it's worth digging through your folders to find the file. Map files show you the memory layout of your system. They depend on your compiler, linker, and processor. And what I show you won't be exactly what you see on your system. I want to give you landmarks uh, to look for. I want you to have a map for exploring your own map file. There are many ways of looking at memory layout in your microcontroller system. Some are here, but let's look at my favorite a little more closely. On the left, you can see how much we have of each type of memory. My system here is a simple chip, just two types, uh, flash and RAM. And this is the sort of memory layout on the left that you might find in your processor's data sheet. On the right, is where I've put the memory, what I've put into the memory. I've drawn it out in rows so I can see the ordering and what touches. There's my code, the constants, the initializers for my globals, some memory to grow into, a little flash storage block, maybe more like a database than a file system, but someplace to keep my serial number, uh, security keys and manufacturing data. And since I want to be able to change my firmware, I have a fixed bootloader to do that. 
In RAM, I have actual globals, a heap for any dynamic memory allocation and a stack. With an RTOS, an operating system with multiple threads, I'd have multiple heaps and stacks. I like looking at memory this way. It's worth sketching out early in the design to make a plan about where things will be and to set expectations about how much code you can put in your processor. But these are big sections, the bird's eye view, and they don't let us dig into what we need when we get to the implementation stage. So why? Why do we need more detail as we do development? Map files can help with lots of problems. There are tools, amazing tools to help you solve these problems. But we'll get back here in more detail. First, let's walk through an actual map file. I want to look through uh, an example program called Hello. This is for a TI chip that can use BLE and ZigBee, and it was compiled with Code Composer Studio. It uses TI's RTOS, which is called BIOS, and it has a main that prints Hello World and exits. Now, there's a bit more going on with the init so that our system printf actually goes someplace. And then there's the operating system piece, BIOS exit, and it, it looks simple, but it's an embedded system. Even printing Hello World isn't really simple. I'm going to switch over to the map file now. And having someone else scroll through this would be tough for me. So if you want to scroll at your own speed, you can find these files on my website at Embedded FM, or I dropped them into the Discord link for those of you watching live. And for those of you who know a bit about map files, I'll put the linker file on the right so you can see if you can connect them. But if you're here for map files, ignore that window. So let's take a look at this map file for a moment or two. It's a wall of hex. It's not nice looking. Reading some of it, the memory configuration, so far so good. Flash and RAM, GP RAM has attributes like Flash and the name says RAM, so probably some sort of RAM. We could look it up, search on Google, the processor name and GP RAM and discover it, it's a cache, but right now we don't care. We just want a bit of orientation with this map file. The segment allocation map, it's not a good name. Better to think of it as a summary. Uh, we can look at what these addresses really are. This is flash. We know that from the address. Right above, it says 00 is flash. It has different data segments, text, const, cnit, reset vec. You can guess what these are or maybe Google them. Though I'll warn you, text means code. because so we're going to see that a lot, and it's important. We can also see where our RAM is. Again, just based on the address. This has different segments as well. Data, heap, BSS, data again, stack. Heap and stack make sense. BSS and data, we'll see a lot more of. As I scroll down, these things get broken into more and more detail, zooming in on the contents of the different, se different sections. And don't read everything. Look mostly at the left side of the screen with the sections. And wherever there's a bit more white space, like here, expect something to be a little more interesting. With BSS and data, these are in RAM. For either one, if we looked at the symbols on the right side when they were on the screen uh, and we wrote this code, we might see a global variable name we recognize. But let's go on to text. These are going to be function names. This is where your code really lives in the chip's flash. The first column is the start address. The second column is the length of that function in flash. If you get a crash and your backtrace says it was at 300, uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 300, uh, looking here, we can see that it must be in the power sleep function on line 157. Scrolling down, this goes on for a good long time. And I have to wonder how much of this we don't really need to run. How many bytes of flash we could get back if we needed them to do more useful work. Oh, oh 353, uh, something new. White space really does make this easier. These are const, constants. Uh, for example, line 365, uh, board GPIO init table. 
this is a, a piece of memory that sets up the GPIO on init. And in the source file, it's marked with the const keyword. That's all this is. It's not magic. Uh, so we're getting down to the module summary, which takes objects of each type of memory, read, write, read only, code. Um, and so now we're getting into some seriously mangled names. Uh, they're actually not important. And I'm less than a third of the way through this file. <sighs> well, now we're getting into the uh, symbols. RAM and flash are being sorted alphabetically. Sure. Good. Scroll faster. No, seriously, scroll faster. We'll be here all day if you don't. OK. Uh, these are just the functions and the variables by name, alphabetically. That's all. And now we're going to get them sorted by address. It's truly the same information. It's repeated from other places. This is the third time we've seen this information. There's a lot of stuff here, but you don't need to read the file from start to finish. It's not that kind of document. A map file is a reference book, like an encyclopedia, not a novel. And that is step one to understanding the map files. Use them, but don't read them. Don't get too bogged down in the details. Don't worry about all the things you don't know. Figure out what you need and go on. There's a lot of duplication in the map files, which makes it handy to find certain types of memory corruption, but it makes the files seem very long. Uh, okay, so now here at 2098, I have a global variable that's being corrupted, um, say in my code. And I noticed that it, it isn't the value I think it should be. Say it's parm buff. So now one of the things I can do with the memory map is look what's around it. Uh, see what's being, what could possibly happen to my parm buff. We have pin handle table there above parm buff. Um, if it's writing beyond its memory, that might explain the corruption I'm seeing in the variable of interest. Walking through files like this, though, is not the best way to use a memory map. Usually, I just search for parm buff until I found something worth investigating. But that was a very simple map file. Let's look at another map file very briefly. Uh, hello was 2,162 lines long. This next one is for a system that does a lot more, including interfacing with both BLE and Zigbee. It also is loaded by a bootloader, which is compiled separately. So we don't see that in our map file. The top looks similar um, and scrolling down, it still looks pretty similar, but I'm not gonna go through all of this again. Um, I think maybe we just need to scroll a lot faster. In fact, let's just scroll to the end. This one is 14,034 lines long, much longer than the other, but it's still full of repetition. And really, I wanna look at a more interesting map file. Let's look at one, let's look at one for an imaginary chip. It still has memory configuration as we saw before and a summary. These are in the middle now instead of at the top of the file. The ordering of map files is often arbitrary, depending on the build tools. Let's look at Ramlandia. We saw BSS and data. We should always expect those. That's where globals go, and that's where our file static and function statics go. Which is which? Well, globals and statics both go into data and BSS. It depends on how they're initialized. Anything with, initial, anything with an initializer goes into data. Anything with no initializer goes into BSS and the lake of zeroing, where they get zeroed out. When we look at the RAM sections, we also expect to see stack and heap. Well, we should always expect to see stack. If you don't see heap and you're in an embedded system, maybe you are intentionally not using dynamic memory. Though sometimes the heap is weirdly invisible, it's implied that everything after the end of listed RAM is heap or sometimes it's called ESIS or system, or sometimes EBSS, the end of BSS, the end of linker allocated memory. And there are a few things here on my map that are, you will not see in your project's map file, things that are part of your system. Uh, first, there's this ocean of unused address space. We only used a tiny fraction of the addresses out there in the map file that we looked through. The zero, zero, zeros and the, hex 2000s. 
even those we only used a small subset of them. But be careful not to put anything in the ocean or a dragon will get it and your system will probably crash. There's an, another address space you can use that isn't on your map, isn't in your map file. The port of peripheral registers, timers, watchdogs, spy, DMA, UART, all those memory mapped registers that you interact with that are hard coded in the address space. These don't show up in your memory map file directly. They're part of your processor manual. Now, across the memory configuration mountains, we have the Flash Federation. Most of that is taken up by code, represented by .text. Why .text? Lost to the sands of time. But at least this is very consistent across different linkers. I have here the forest of functions and orchard of functions with the mirror lake in between. That isn't part of your processor memory, although it can be part of your map file. Um, functions go wherever they go, depending on your linker optimization. But when we looked at Hello Map, we saw functions laid out in multiple ways, and I wanted to represent that here. The code section also usually has an int vec or reset vec or someplace where the interrupt vector table goes. And sometimes it's at a fixed address, sometimes not. It may be ram vec and be over in ramlandia. It should be somewhere, though we can't quite know where it will be or what it will be called. So. I want to go to Initopia here. Here we have CNIT, which is the source of RAM's river of initialization, data's river of initialization. All those static and global variables that get initialized, they have to get their initialization values stored from somewhere in Flash. That all gets sorted out before your processor gets to me. It's part of your init process for C and C++. It's called C startup, if you want to know more. C startup copies the RAM functions Oh, sorry. C startup also copies RAM functions, which can be there for speed. Uh, maybe there are a few small functions that need to run really fast. So let's go on to Constantinia. Const, well, they're constants. Um, things you mark with the const keywords or strings that are hard coded. And by marking them with the const keyword, they don't take up RAM and they don't take up boot time to get initialized. I believe I said not everything applies everywhere. RO data is where many compilers, including GCC, usually put the variables marked with the const keyword. Sometimes you have const, sometimes you have RO data, sometimes you have both, and you may never see switch, which is used for lookup tables for switch expressions. Uh, the tables will still be built, but they'll get put into read-only memory unless there's a special section uh, where we might have a faster bit of memory to run our switches from. There are lots of these little linker keywords like this, and we usually ignore them. You can learn more about these different data segments from the internet. It isn't critical to remember what each one does. They try to give hints in their names, except for BSS, which is block starting symbol, but really should be blank something something, so that we remember it's full of zeros. In addition to the parts of the system you usually see, you may choose to allocate space to other things like a storage system, a file system, or a bootloader. And depending on your optimization layer level, sorry, alt, depending on your optimization level, optimization level, and build system, you may see a list of discarded functions in your map file. Those are the linker showing you how clever it is by showing you functions you shouldn't have bothered to write. Oh, and down here, you didn't think all memory mapped registers were documented, right? Now, clearly, I had a lot of fun putting this together, and you, you can have access to it. It's pretty easy to find, including on the page that I mentioned, and it's at the bottom of almost every slide. Now that we know what's in the map file, let's look at how to use it. We've seen this list of problems and some possible tools. Not every tool works for every problem. So let me go into these in a little bit more detail. Let's say you're at a code space. First thing to do is to look at the memory configuration and summary. Does your summary match the expectations you have based on the processor data sheet? 
How much memory do you have? How much do you expect? And what kinds of memory do you have? The next step is to decide where's your memory going? Looking at the more detailed information, the function list. Are you short of RAM because you put a library into RAM functions? Is it your code that's large because you have a ton of constants? Maybe it's all those strings you print out to the debug port. Another question to ask yourself is whether it's a new problem. If so, what changed? Are you, if you suddenly run out of space, was it because someone used a particular function that, called a whole, that caused a whole library to be included? Comparing files does mean you have to keep around the old map files or be able to easily rebuild them. I recommend releasing them with your binaries, but that's just me. And while looking through the map files, we saw functions were ordered in different ways by name and address. Sometimes they're often ordered by size. And if you're really hitting a wall, trying to find those last few bytes of RAM or code space, sometimes a visualizer can help. The idea is to make a viewer that looks sort of like this, uh, but with a lot more detail. I looked for a commercial or open source tool to show you what one would look like, but I found very little that did what I wanted. Long ago, I made an aux script to parse my map file into an HTML table with cells proportional to the memory used. It was for a Kyle compiler on 8051. I am sure that there will be a visualizer soon for this because it is such a problem, but I have been saying that since 2000. And once you get accustomed to your map file output, you'll see it doesn't change that much. So scripting a visualizer isn't that tough. And once you make friends with your map file, you may not need to. I've added some visualizer links and resources at the end of the slides, but I didn't find any that I would add to my personal useful tools list. And as you go about optimizing, look at the largest consumers first. Look at the things that are taking up the most space and reduce those. Saving 10% from 100 bytes isn't going to help as much as shaving 10% from 1,000. You may find some unexpected libraries are included. You can trace through the functions to see where they're called and find out why those libraries are included with the map file. And some libraries are monolithic, included if any function is used. Other libraries are granular, loading only the required functions. Even the C standard libraries can be monolithic so that using a built-in string copy function can lead to a large footprint. Many times you can write a function to replace that library. Other times you'll need to figure out how to work around the limitation. Um, let me give you some examples to get ideas flowing. Uh, replace floating point numbers with a fixed point representation. Replace printf with a few functions that don't take variable arguments like log string and log with num. Replace str copy with your own implementation to exclude the strings library. And replace abs function with a macro to remove floating point math library dependencies. You get the idea. And I am not suggesting you do any of those before you know you have a problem. When you do need to optimize, I'm a huge fan of tracking the changes you made and the results they had because it isn't always straightforward. If you have compile or link time optimizations turned on, your attempts may not go as you expect, at least not until you get the hang of it. So that's how you use a memory map to consider RAM and code space. Oh, I have a question. I have a question here, a question about RAM, about knowing how much RAM is left in the system. Okay, didn't I answer that in the memory map? Oh, I know the question is about how much RAM do I have left when I'm running? I knew that was the question. And I have a sinking suspicion. I'm going to have to actually address this one. Let's say this is your memory, your RAM. These are our global and static variables. They have initializers. We know that the C initializers get put into RAM from flash. Filling them in is part of the C startup process before main happens. And back to our lake of zeroing, also part of the C startup process, the BSS globals and static are initialized to zero. Everything else is shown as unused in our memory map summary. But it's not unused, no, no. This is where the heap and stack go. For most systems, the heap grows down and the stack grows up and we hope they never meet in the middle, but I have my suspicions. 
Once we call main, variables in the function go on the stack. Some variables are small enough they might go into a register, but most variables, especially the big ones, go into the stack memory. Uh, we put it on the stack. So let's say we now malloc some memory. Malloc memory goes on the memory we call the heap. As main goes along, we allocate another bit of memory. Uh, and we don't necessarily know how the heap is managed. It depends on your C library. But I'm going to pretend it's a pretty naive heap manager. And new mallocs are just going to go right next to each other. Uh, now let's call another function. The new function's variables get put onto the stack. And, and this will be important soon. The return address to get from our function back to main is put into a register, return address register. So we can find our way back to where foo was called from, back to main. So let's allocate some more memory, three corals, eh, four spiky corals. Let's call another function, another turtle. Of course, this represents the variables newly declared, variables declared in our newly called function. More importantly, and before that, the contents of the return address register is put on the stack. So the stack has breadcrumbs telling us how to get back to our main function. We'll use the return address register to return from here, and then we'll pop the stack, remove the turtle, take things off and make them usable. And that includes the return address register. Then we get back to main by popping the stack again. So the stack pointer would go back to the first turtle. But for now, we're three turtles in. And I use turtles because of the story about flat earth, about the flat earth being on the back of a turtle. But what does the turtle stand on? It's turtles all the way down. The stack is like that. It is stack frames all the way down, each one full of variables and breadcrumbs to find our way home. OK, another malloc, five this time. Another function. I said before, but I feel like mentioning it again. If you had an RTOS, each thread would get its own heap and stack. But threads heap and stack, each thread's heap and stack would probably be contiguous and laid out like this. Though your RTOS may keep track of your stack pointer and cause an exception when you have too many turtles that blow out the stack memory. Six, six brain corals allocated. Bwahahaha. Another function, another stack frame. I do feel like I should start playing the Jaws theme. Seven violet corals allocated. Another function, another turtle. And here, here we are with the last allocation. Eight chunks of coral, of RAM. At this point, we have zero, zero bytes of memory left. And finally, we can answer the question of how much memory we have left. How do you tell how much RAM you have left? When the heap pointer equals the stack pointer, you have zero bytes of RAM left. You haven't crashed. This is fine. Like a dog sitting in a cafe on fire. This is fine. You just can't call another function or allocate anything further. If you called another function, your stack would put it into the corals, messing up the data already stored there. If, you're, if you malloc more memory, you would lose the top of the stack, scatter the breadcrumbs, and not be able to find your way home. In fact, you'd probably try to return and end up someplace random. As we are full up in our memory now, let's, let's free some of those pointers to malloc memory. We still need the last set, but not the seven violet corals, or the five flowers, or the three rose-like ones. How much memory will we get back? Uh, seven plus five plus three is 13. How much memory do we have now? Seven plus five plus three is 15 corals. But you can't call another function and you can't allocate 15 corals. Your memory is fragmented. And this is why many folk avoid heap in embedded systems. If you're allocating and freeing memory in a system without garbage collection, your memory can get fragmented to the point where you have a bunch free, but you can't allocate what seems like a small buffer. And this is why how much RAM do I have left is an impossible question. How much do you have in your heap? Is it contiguous or fragmented? How many function calls deep are you? If we disallowed malloc, disallowed the heap in our system, we'd know how much memory we had. It would be from the bottom of BSS to the top of stack. But we could only fill that with function calls, stack variables, and turtles. 
if you had a hardware abstraction layer, layer that's like five layers deep in your system, that's a lot of stack memory, just building up, reaching for the heap and certain doom. There are static tools uh, to tell you how deep your call tree is. So you can estimate your stack usage and keep track of a high water mark that indicates the most amount of stack you've used. Though, if you use recursion, a function that calls itself, then your stack can grow and grow and grow because it depends on runtime circumstances. You can't estimate your maximum stack size, which is why many embedded developers shy away from recursion. So here we are, back to how much RAM do I have in my system? And the answer is not what any of us wanted. But the word ineffable is one of the finer ones in the English language. Let's go back to memory maps, which is what this talk was about before I got distracted. Let's talk about debugging the impossible bugs since we're kind of on the subject. Uh, these are the icky crawly ones you worry about late at night, but you can't reliably reproduce on your desk. Not the ones where the heap and stack merge. Those, those can also ca cause hard faults, but other hard faults, which are where your processor says, nope, you just can't do that. Like, when you try to write to null, which in our address space is flash, it's zero, zero, and that's the start of flash, not a place you can normally just write to. Or you can get a hard fault when you try to jump to code that isn't code at all. If you're fortunate and you have a debugging tool attached, you get a backtrace, and that can help you figure out where you were when the hard fault was triggered. If you aren't lucky, there'll be some digging on your part. Maybe from the hard fault interrupt, you managed to write your return address register to a log or serial port before resetting. Then you'll need the memory map file to figure out where you were when things went wrong. And note, you'll need the memory map file of the image you're running. So be careful about your versions. Even with a debugger and backtrace available, having the map file open while you look at the stack and the CPU registers might help you figure out where the code was when things went horribly wrong. And note that searching directly for the address may not work as the map file lists the beginning of the function and you need to look around for functions that are near your address, which is easy enough if your map file includes functions in address order. The process is similar with the weird memory errors, which sometimes lead to hard faults, uh, sometimes just lead to random results. If you have a global buffer that's getting corrupted, and you can look in the memory map file to see what's nearby, well, is UART buff overflowing into ADC buffer? Finding corrupted memory near the end of segments can also be interesting. This variable is right before the top of stack. It's getting mangled. Maybe I should see if my stack is overflowing. Figuring out exactly what to do isn't easy. And there's still gonna be a lot of trying to make it happen more often, trying to figure out when it crept into the code and general head scratching. But your map file gives you a few more tools, makes it easier to find those flash and RAM addresses to find the root causes. On to firmware updates. As you plan out your system, think about how your memory should look. You need your bootloader here, space large enough for the new version to go into, an updatable library like Nordic soft devices, where do those go? Is your storage system supposed to stay intact through firmware update? Being able to sketch out a high level memory map will help you figure this out, where things should be. And the linker file, the linker file we are definitely not discussing, will cause the linker to place the sections where it thinks you want them. Then the actual map file, our memory map file can show you where they are. And when working with firmware update, you may need multiple map files when debugging firmware update. There's the new code, the old code, the bootloader's code, the soft devices, and they all have to agree on where they're supposed to go for firmware update to work properly. And finally, possibly inexplicably, the map file can show you how to make your code run faster. First, if your code suddenly starts to get slow, there's the diff with the last known good map file. What changed? It may be too small to see in the map file, so diffing your version control might work better. And yet sometimes you can't see why fabs instead of abs made such a big difference until you see a giant library added in to support floats. Next, look at the summary. 
look at those memory characteristics. Did you even know that Flash can have wait states so that every time you read from Flash, you to run code or to read a constant the system just waits for, a stop, for like six cycles. But knowing how many wait states each type of memory has will let you, will give you options for speeding up execution. Oops, by moving the, by being able to move code to faster memory. Uh, for example, you may want to copy a critical function to zero wait state RAM if that's faster than your normal program flash. For many optimization problems, if you are overusing one type of resource, like your CPU cycles, and you have another available, you can parlay that into a working solution. And finally, for using the map files to speed up your system, look at statistical sampling. This is going to be a ridiculously brief explanation of a very interesting subject. A statistical sampling profiler runs in an interrupt and stores the return address, thereby figuring out which functions you're, you spend the most of your time in. Of course, you need a pretty big RAM buffer and some extra code. Uh, and you could do this with a JTAG programmer or a system debugger, especially the ones that support trace. But sometimes you can't. Sometimes you have to do it in the field. So once you get a dump of the addresses of the functions that the timer interrupted, you can use the map file to figure out where you're spending all your time. As I mentioned, this is kind of hard, uh, but if you need it, the possibility is there and you'll definitely need a map file. So that's what you can do with map file and the tools to do it. We didn't use one of those, so I fixed it. Let's look at another map file. One from a different compiler, GCC. Well, not really GCC generated because GCC is the compiler. A program called LD does the actual linking. And that's what generates the map file we're about to look at. Before we get there, let's look at memory map land again, the pretty map file in hopes that you find it amusing. While I warn you about the graphic content we're about to see. GNU generated maps are not pretty. If you thought the ones that I was scrolling through earlier were a wall of hex and nonsense, just close your eyes for the next bit. Not only are these maps tough to read, you have to ask for them specially from the linker. The one I'm gonna show is for Adafruit's CircuitPython running on a Cduino Zhao, which has a microchip AT SAM D21, an ARM Cortex M0 plus. It's a pretty complicated system running a Python parser from a file system. It starts with the, a list of files. Um, we, I mean, why? But uh, then we go on to more important things. Oh, here's a list of discarded inputs. That's sure something I wanna know. Oh, hey, the memory configuration mountains, there they are. Hey, I thought we said we weren't doing the linker file. No, I said definitely not linker file. Why are you doing this? Who's in charge here? Fine, I'll talk about it in a little while. Talk about linker files later. Settle your optical sensor down. Okay, we're in the function forest in the dot text in the county of code. And now we're moving on to Constantinia, the RO buffer, the RO segments. Um, these go on for a good long time, as expected in a system of this scale. And now we're starting to get into other stuff, but none of it's very big. So I'm pretty happy just skipping it. Oh, and here's Ramlandia. They don't have any RAM functions. Kind of sad, I like those. And all that data along the river of initialization, both globals and statics, here is that data. And we're gonna move along and then we're gonna get to BSS with its lake of zeroing, still globals and statics. And here we are getting to the stacks. The stack ends at 2,027.34, but the RAM from the memory configuration goes to 2,008,000. So we have 58cc, around 22k left over. Remember that, we'll need it later. So moving along, uh, we have some stuff that looks important, but who knows? 
Let's skip those and come back if we need them. Or maybe Google arm.attributes and find out it has something to do with arm and probably isn't something to mess with. Safe to ignore. Oh, now the map file tells us we should load all these objects. I mean, did I really need to know that? Isn't that something some other tools should do? Uh, dot comment, debug frame, they don't look critical. They aren't huge, we can Google them. But for the most part, ignoring is okay. Ah, uh, yes, the cross-reference table. I guess GCC doesn't think we have, or doesn't think we have search because here's a list of where every function is defined. I suppose it might be useful if we're getting a function from an unexpected library, but mostly snooze. And that's it. I mean, there was a lot of scrolling and ignoring, but we saw most of what we expected. We didn't see the heap explicitly called out, but the build message uh, on the bottom gives us a little clue about that. The EBSS gives us another little clue about where the heap will be placed. And remember, in order to get the GNU looker file, you, or in order to get the GNU map file, you may have to use a compiler, linker, flag. At the beginning, I promised to tell you a little more about where map files come from. And I've mentioned the linker file, but how does the linker really know where to put all the code and constants in Flash and that the statics and globals should go in RAM? There's the linker file, which has been on the screen a couple of times. It usually ends with command or dot make or dot LD or link. And explaining them in detail would be a whole nother talk. But let me show you a little taste of what a linker file looks like. This was up on the screen before, but let's look a little more closely and compare the hello example link file with its map file. You can see they're definitely siblings. See how the memory and memory configuration matched? And then we have these sections that we see again later. Those sections go into different types of memory, flash and SRAM. And I hope you can start to see how this answers some of the questions like, why is our flash organized like this? Why do some parts of our code go into Flash and other parts into RAM? Because that's what the linker file told it to do. And, whoops, well, that's going to be a problem. This is another area where the GNU tools are pretty much the worst for learning. Uh, their link files are usually much harder to read with many tools that end up doing exceedingly clever things with CNIT and BSS variables, making them hard to see in the link file and in the map file. According to its man page, the GNU linker LD accepts linker command language files written in a superset of AT&T's link editor command language syntax. So in order for your code to build, an unknown program accepts bizarre files in an archaic language. Our world, our embedded systems are full of wizardry and incantations. And yet linker files are very important, especially if you're allocating specific sections for some sort of storage, or you have a bootloader or the ability to switch between application images. Still, you need the map file. You need to understand the map file before you can understand the linker file. The linker files are the directions. The map file is the reality. Honestly, I haven't figured out a way to make map link. I haven't found a way to make linker files fun. My thought, and it really is just a thought, nowhere near a plan involves a Rube Goldberg machine. I think embedded systems is hard to teach because we jump to so many details. How many of you were shouting tail recursion in the section about sacks of turtles? Yes, tail recursion is awesome, but aren't there fundamentals to learn before we worry about optimizing everything? Between hardware and software, our world is made up of exceptions, tweaky little things that aren't always true, corners we cut to keep costs down. How do you teach things in the right order to show the fun, the technical information, design methodologies, and a hundred little details that depend on the processor and application? I don't know. 
I have been excited to have Arduino be a popular thing, to let people play with the hardware and software, to fall in love with making gadgets. But we need a bridge between play and work. I tend to like metaphors and simplifications, and I spend a lot of time near the ocean, but nothing replaces experience. How do we make it easier? And this is something I would like to talk about further, but I'm about out of time. So thank you for being here. I'm Elia White. If you'd like the pretty memory map land file for yourself, there is a link on the slide. If you've enjoyed this presentation, you may enjoy Embedded, a weekly podcast where we talk to folks about the how and why of the systems they make. And I'm doing a Making Embedded Systems course through ClassPert based on my book, which doesn't focus on one processor or heavily on code, but tries to give you a framework for what to expect when making embedded systems. The new cohort for making embedded systems through ClassPert starts on March 12th. Well, let's just say it starts in March. Let's not get too excited. Uh, for those of you watching now, I have a coupon code good for the next two weeks from today, which now November 18th, uh, and it's good for the next two weeks or the first 25 seats. But the course doesn't start till March. And that's about it. So let's get back to Elliot. Hey, thank you very much, Alicia. That's fantastic. Uh, we're going to work on some questions real quick so you can answer them. There were a few that went out as you were giving the talk. I think the first one actually got answered as you were going along, but Pierce Nichols asked, can the map file be used to instrument which functions are being run? That would be useful for finding the holes in hardware in the loop test programs, for instance. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. And I think you ended up covering that in, the, in one of those sections. So, um, waiting for some more questions to come rolling in. People are saying your graphics were fantastic. And uh, I have to agree. The, uh, there's nothing I'm more scared of than the heap crashing with the stack. And uh, you explained those holes beautifully. Thank you. Um, for most of the art, I used Incarnate, Incarnate. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a Dungeons and Dragons style map tool. And okay. it was a lot of fun to put together. As for why map files are so complicated to start with, because they do all these things. That repetition that I talked about, where you have the, the files ordered in different ways. Well, at some point I said, I needed to know what was around the file. And then at another point I said, I needed to know how big the files were. And so they reproduce the information trying to solve all the problems they can come up with. Now, I don't know why they ever put it in alphabetical order. That just doesn't make sense to me. But yes, there is a reason they're so complicated because they do so much. Uh, the list of tools, the map visualizers, here are the map visualizers. Um, this is also available in the slide deck, which I've already mentioned is available. Um, let's see. Statistical sampling from Mike Stish. And when it's most useful to use that trick? Well, the best way to do it now is to buy something with trace capability and do it on your desk because it's gonna save you a lot of time. But uh, that isn't always possible. Uh, sometimes systems behave better on your desk than they do in the field. And so if you want to know why the field systems are running out of CPU, however you decide they're running out of CPU, but they are clearly CPU limited when they shouldn't be, when they aren't on your desk. That's where statistical sampling really comes into play where you start with a giant RAM buffer and you put your return addresses in over and over again and you count, you know, I was in, uh, I was at this address, I was at this address, I was at this address. And then you take that list of addresses and you go to the map file and you say, oh, this is, this is in delay millisecond. This is in printf. This is in, oh, that function I really meant to take out before I shipped it. Um, and so, I wouldn't do it for normal profiling because there are tools, 
uh, that are better than statistical sampling. But those tools don't always work um, in, every, in every case. These are terrible questions, people. <laughs> But thank you. I, I really do appreciate what you're saying. It's, it's very nice. It's very kind of you to say. Do you want to see the map file again? That's probably the best slide I have. You'll need to reshare your screen, Alicia, if you're showing the map file. Oh, oh really? OK. Oh, well, then you probably didn't see the map visualizers either. Does that mean I need to bail out? This one. Oh, probably I didn't want you to see me surfing Discord, which clearly you already know I'm doing. <laughs> so that's the pretty map. And now I've Discord on it. And then I also uh, pinned the link to this file in the Discord general channel for people that are in there. Um, let's see, RAM funks. RAM funks appear in both flash and RAM memory segments. Um, under what conditions would a function be put into RAM and is there a way to know in advance where a function will be put? Functions are put wherever the linker file tells them to. Uh, the reason you would put a file into RAM would be if your RAM runs faster than your flash and you need to run fast. Uh, you can also, there's also bootloader reasons to do that, but I don't wanna talk about those. Um, and so what happens is your function gets compiled to flash. I mean, it gets compiled and then it gets written to your flash. And then on C startup, flash says, oh, I have a RAM function. I'll have to copy this whole file, or this whole function over into RAM because all of the other places, all of the other things that call this function point to a place in RAM and not to the place in flash. Does that make sense? Does somebody want me to do that again? I can only see Elliot. So if he's not nodding, I don't know what you're saying. Um, I'm okay, nobody's typing. They're all typing. That's true. <laughs> uh, no map visualizer does what you want it to do. What would be points on my wish list? I want uh, the ability to look at RAM and code separately. Uh, a lot of them right now are, are combining, but usually you're having one problem or the other. I want to be able to have proportional sizes so I can visualize and say, oh, that's where most of my memory is. I want to be able to mark off bits and say, I can't change that library. Uh, I want to be able to have it look nice, which is hard because you have a little tiny function that's only uh, 15 bytes long and you're comparing it to a monstrous function that's two kilobytes long. And how do you put those in the same visualization? You can, you can use logarithmic methods, but then you're not really being true to what it's saying. Uh, if you want to talk more about that, I would be happy to talk more about what I want in Map Visualizer. But the high-level answer was that uh, was the one that I had up. Uh, let's see, the one that I said was kind of like your processors. Okay, I just should have started at the beginning because that's where it's, it is. This is a very long presentation. Thank you for sticking through it with me. This one, I want it to look kind of like this, where I can see the different kinds of memory and I can zoom in on certain parts. It's still sharing my screen, yes. Okay, good. Uh, what about self-modifying code? Um, Part of me is like, don't do that. The other part of me is like, that's a bootloader. Uh, yes, of course we have self-modifying code. Uh, would you put that in RAM functions? Yes, uh, but I hope you know what you're doing. 
because I don't. Um, but we do have, you know, we put things in bootloaders and then we modify our flash and that's self-modifying. Um, and sometimes the bootloader needs to go in RAM so that we can erase all of our flash. And sometimes the bootloader can be snuck into a part of flash, a page that doesn't need to be erased. What is the coolest debug you had to do with map files? Um, that would be at LeapFrog where uh, software was cheap and hardware was hideously expensive. So every single byte was just, I mean, you had to wring it out. Uh, and that was where I did the visualizations so that I could, because we had a fair amount of flash, but RAM was always, always low. And if you could figure out where it was going or how to cheat so that you were using uh, flash uh, memory instead of RAM, it was very helpful. And when I say flash on that, I actually mean ROM because toys don't have flash. They, they have um, read-only memory that gets programmed in masks that probably somebody here will be talking about very cool, the chips that don't have flash and big, big consumer problems. All right, thank you very much. We're gonna take a quick break, I think, but will you be around to stick around in the Discord for a little bit if people have some more questions. I will, absolutely. Um, and I may have some questions for some other talks because you have an excellent lineup today. And yeah, I'm excited to see the rest of it. Thank you. See you in a bit. Everyone Bye. else out there, our next talk is coming up in 10 minutes or so. It's Maurits Fennis. He is working on reducing e-waste through reverse engineering. I'll talk to you more about that. Stick around and we will get to it shortly. Hello, can you see me? Yep. Uh, yes, good. we can see you. I can't see anybody. <laughs> <laughs> We're all hiding. <laughs> I'm terrified. <laughs> oh, no, don't worry. OK, so I believe that all this audio is going out live to the stream. Uh, but welcome. Hey. What's interesting is I think as host and because I'm sharing my screen, I don't see anybody. Um, does it look like your camera's working just right? This video looks good. Great. All right. So uh, does the audio looks good. I think we're all set. Um, the counter is counting down and we'll have uh, Elliot come in with about a minute left on the counter and do the introduction at that point. Um, you can unmute your audio and video and uh, and take it away. Do you have any questions? Um, yes. Um, you just said that all of that audio, that everything I just said went to the stream. Is that correct? I believe that people on the stream are hearing us right now, yes. OK, that's fine. <laughs> all right, well, we'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you.
Hey everybody, and welcome back to Hackaday Remoticon. Our next talk is Maurits Fennis. He's been an artist, a composer, an architectural designer. He's kind of like a lot of us, a jack of all trades. What he's working on right now is reducing e-waste through reverse engineering, and he's here to talk to us about his project. This is something that I think is kind of vitally important as we throw so much good stuff away, but it's often locked up and we can't get into it. So I'm super excited to see this talk and welcome to the Hackaday Remoticon, Moritz Fennis. Hey everybody. It's uh, wonderful to be here. Uh, it's an honor to be amongst all of you. And uh, I look forward to speaking to you. Um, I'll share my screen for a moment. Right. Um, so this talk is called Hack for the Planet, a Reverse Engineering Embedded Systems to Reduce E-Waste. Um, like, uh, like has been mentioned before, uh, I'm Maritz Fennis. I'm a hacker and reverse engineer. Um, I've previously dabbled in architectural design and music, uh, multimedia installations, um, and I've been active for about 20 years. Um, I am the founder of Unbinary, which is an e-waste reverse engineering laboratory in Belgium, in Antwerp. It was founded in 2020, uh, just before the pandemic. And we collaborate with recycling and refurbishing companies to reduce the global rise in e-waste. Uh, in Belgium, there are quite a few initiatives, especially in Flanders, that specifically focus on reducing e-waste. Um, that is Flandern Circulaire, uh, Achoria, and Cirrus, and we all work with them, and they are wonderful partners. Now, just to um, get a quick overview of what e-waste is, I think I am with the right crowd uh, that you obviously know what e-waste consists of. Um, it is usually discarded electronics, TVs, computers, uh, phones. You, you know, you, you, we could name a lot more. Um, and you know, these are usually uh, dumped. Um, elsewhere in large sites. Now, what are the causes um, of the global rise in e-waste? Is primarily uh, overconsumption, um, the short lifespan of electronic devices. Um, we know that when we buy a phone, it would only last about two years. Um, any other device uh, you can think of usually has a very short lifespan. Uh, planned obsolescence, you know, uh, uh, manufacturers make sure that your device dies so you can buy a new one from them, or they will make your device obsolete with a new version they've produced. Um, the inability to repair, now the right to repair movement is very active these days, so I think you've, you've uh, got the message there. Abandoned software support, end of life status, I think we know about this. Uh, the destruction of unsold products. We know uh, Amazon is, is kind of guilty of doing this frequently. Um, the non-adherence to environmental standards, poor waste management, and uh, resulting in illegal dumping and processing. Now I'd like to focus on overconsumption. Um, if I've read a lot of literature regarding this topic and what comes up frequently is that richer countries tend to consume a lot more electronics. And then as soon as we are done with them, we dump them uh, in poorer countries. Um, so overconsumption, I think, is the main cause. Well, the GESP um, released the Global E-Waste Monitor of 2020. And in that global e-waste monitor, uh, we found that each person produced about 7.3 kilograms of e-waste each year. That results in 53.6 million tons of e-waste. And the most surprising figure I found is that only 17.4% was properly collected and recycled. This means that 82.6% 
of generated e-waste had an uncertain destination, which means that we don't know where it went. You know, 8% thereof is discarded in landfills or incinerated. And as you can see in this image, this doesn't follow any health guidelines or environmental guidelines. Or it's in seven to 20% is exported illegally. Now the majority is mixed up with other waste streams and that ends up in the informal sector of less developed countries where they are traded, burned, dumped in landfills and kind of endangering the health of people that process this waste and ultimately the environment at large. Now, um, there are a lot of ways we could solve this issue. Um, there are a lot of different strategies. Um, there are a lot of collective um, organizations and collectives that focus on policy, um, try and get some political influence. Um, there are companies that try and make uh, devices that can be repaired. Um, there are um, organizations that focus more on the humanitarian aspects. Um, but all of these initiatives focus on scale. Uh, there's a strong uh, awareness of the scale of the issue and try to address the scale primarily. Um, what we do at Unbinary is that we try and do this in a grassroots approach. Um, most of you have labs. Most of you have know-how and uh, most of you are extremely talented. Um, I have been on Hackaday since 2012 and I've seen all of your beautiful artworks. And so there's all of this talent that uh, is there to solve this issue um, and all this know-how that can be shared. And at Unbinary, we thought, what if we create very simple tools that we can open source and then share with this community and see what this community does. Also, um, we learn a lot from you. Uh, all of these projects that you are doing with uh, uh, retro systems uh, really inspire us. And we thought it, it would be fun to make tools that are so simple, they don't require a lot of maintenance, don't require a lot of programming and could just be used simply. One of them is the oyster. Um, the oyster started uh, right before we were a reverse engineering uh, company. I was doing um, independent security research on a, uh, on a on a um, on a smart meter uh, that had EFM thirty two microcontroller, and um, that got me more interested in uh, ARM microcontrollers. So. I try to uh, remove that microcontroller and put it on a small breakout board, um, but obviously it doesn't have any decoupling and that will turn into a nightmare. So I thought, why not build my own board so I can do proper analysis? So I reached out to a company in China and they sent me a few of these QFP48 sockets that I needed at the time. Um, in, the, in the left of that image, you can see uh, the pins, and you can see that already that that could be quite a nightmare to route. Uh, so that turned into this spaghetti. Um, <laughs> uh, this eventually um, took a while to do properly. Uh, also, when it comes to doing a power analysis and glitching, making sure that that runs okay. Um, and that turned into the Oyster. Um, it's an STM32 L5 target board for salvaged MCUs. So what we mainly use it for is that if we get e-waste uh, and they happen to have uh, microcontrollers with this footprint, we could, we could uh, remove them and place them in here. Um, we use it for debugging and glitching. Um, power is through USB-C, a coin cell or external PSU. It has a 48 pin breakout near the top. I think you can see that. And it has five debug headers. Now you might be wondering why would you put five debug headers if one standard ARM debug like STDC14 uh, should be enough, right? Or a 10 pin. 
Um, well, we have a lot of debuggers here in the lab, and I've gotten kind of gotten used to using several different debuggers uh, for different purposes in the same session. And usually when I'm working, it's a bit frantic, like an artist. I was trained as an artist, which means I'm super messy. And this means that I would like to work quite fast. And that means I just wanted all the headers there. So I didn't need to think about it and just continue working. It has uh, six MS, uh, SMA connectors, uh, which connect to the LSE clock, the HSC clock, and uh, the power plane um, for power analysis and glitching. And it has several jumpers so you can bypass all of the connectors and um, solder jumpers in the back. It has 3D printed magnetic feet. So the device stays on your bench. It's kind of useful because the, the socket tends to pop open and flip the board. You don't want the microcontroller to, to fall out. Um, the backside has artwork and that artwork has uh, a, a small, a little bit of an idea. Um, That artwork is the face of Paul Feyerabend, which is a philosopher I grew up with, um, whose work against method I discovered back in 2003 uh, when I was studying uh, music and fine art in The Hague. Um, I'll get back to him in a moment. Uh, we created his face with uh, uh, we created his face with a halftone effect that is a script we wrote in NURBS in uh, in Rhino 3D, um, where each uh, grayscale value um, controlled the diameter of a uh, circular nerve surface, and that would create that effect. Eventually, we used SVG to mod to get that into KiCad. So here is his, this is where he is. Uh, this is uh, Paul Feyerabend. Uh, he's a philosopher of science and he didn't coin the term, uh, but um, he's known for his epistemological anarchism. And that basically means he had strong critiques of the scientific method and the culture that around, surrounds science. Um, in a way, when I read his uh, literature, I uh, I recognize the hacker in him. Uh, he questions absolutely everything, and uh, especially science. And at the time, uh, I was also studying mathematics for a while. And the culture at the university, I didn't feel that connected with. Um, so I left, uh, and I stuck with the artists. Uh, and uh, he kind of reminds me of, of uh, a way of thinking that um, is important these days, where we question our first principles of the axioms we use to uh, do work, do research, and live if we want to make sure that we uh, don't do much harm to the planet. Now, that questioning, I would like to uh, shortly uh, apply to a dictionary term of what it means to be a reverse engineer. Usually when I speak to other people and I explain that I'm reverse engineer, I get a description that is similar to this one. Um, I recently, I spoke to somebody and they said, ah, corporate espion espionage. Uh, and that's not at all uh, what I'm used to doing. Um, and so if we remove those aspects, right? We only get to the disassembly and the examination and the analysis and the discovery of concepts that are involved in the manufacturing of a device. But we can even reduce that further. We could say, who cares about products or devices? Who cares about manufacturing? First engineering is about examining. It's about curiosity. It's about discovering concepts. It's about thinking philosophically about what you have in your hands. That's also what makes praxis different from practice.
Now, if we analysis, uh, if we uh, analyze um, devices, you need probes. And during the pandemic, it was very hard to find probes um, that suited my needs. So I created the first version of the Unbe Pro, which is a silly name, but you know, I stuck with it, uh, which is basically magnet wire, a header, and a spring-loaded needle, and a 3D printed case. And um, as you can see in the left, it's thick enough so you can hold it in your hand. And I created a little arm uh, that allows you to place it on a PSB so it will stay put. Now, eventually we went through about seven or eight iterations for this. And one of the problems I constantly encountered was that the pin, um, the initial travel distance wasn't that long and that the pin would be uh, lifted from the board because there was no weight holding it down. So I was trying to find different ways to make sure that its usage was reliable. Um, so eventually we went to a PCB uh, format for it. So it's got, and near the tip, it's got a passive spring-loaded needle probe um, that's in a receptacle. It's got a two-pin header, uh, a high-frequency SMA connector, uh, two solder jumpers, two pads for 0402 size SMD components. Um, and it's got solder jumpers near there. And the spear needle can be removed from the receptacle and replaced with uh, concave, convex, and serrated heads. Um, we designed it this way because I sometimes needed decoupling capacitors there, or I needed an LED just to see if there's anything there. So I could kind of play around with it and be flexible with it. Um, most probes that I had didn't allow me to play around with it that much. So we, you know, we wanted to do that with this one. As you can see, the pitch is quite slim. It's got a 1.27 millimeter pitch and a uh, 2.65 millimeter travel distance. Uh, that means that the travel distance is long enough so that when I push it down, it'll stick. And the pitch is kind of important in combination with a slim long neck. You know, there, while developing this, you know, the, I found that there are other companies that also make similar uh, probes, but I found them quite bulky for my use. The boards that we usually deal with are either very large or very small. And um, the, the pitch that we need um, is a lot smaller um, than what would what the heads of those probes would allow. We're currently at version 0 0.2. This is the one uh, where we will start open sourcing it uh, from uh, December on. Uh, so you can build your own. Um, also, we have uh, prototypes available for free. So if you contact us, uh, we could just send them in an envelope um, if you pay for shipping. Um, we've improved the VFNs because it needed some improving. Um, we've added curved traces and we did the SMA footprint to spec because it wasn't before, it was an error that we had. Now, obviously you don't use one probe uh, while you are working on a board, you probably need more and depending on the board you have. So we built a base, the, the Unbe Pro base, um, which is magnetic, uh, which has 12 SMA connectors, a 12 pin header in the back and a prototyping area for 0603 size um, SMT components and ground buses in the prototyping area so you can be flexible and the possibility to bridge SMA connectors. The bridging of SMA connectors was kind of important for us and to be flexible. Um, also that, you know, because uh, we, we tend to work in mysterious ways and sometimes we just need to do that. And we use hand formable RF SMA to SMA cables. They're quite expensive, but they're, they're useful. You can use anything you want. Um, the the uh, pro base has a small footprint um, and that is because uh, usually when we're working and we worked with other probes before, um, the bench would get full quite quick. 
and we just wanted to make sure that we didn't use as much space on the bench and this allows us to work in a very kind of lean fashion um, it has twins tw 10 small magnets on the magnetic base so it doesn't move Now I made a little mistake, and this is again uh, about working in nonlinear ways. I forgot the ground pin on the 12 pin header prior to production, which is a very silly mistake. And I'm a dad, you know, so I was probably tired. Uh, so I add one, uh, I added one and uh, which created an L shape uh, and decided to apply the same operation to the prototyping area. So now it looks like the prototyping area is kind of bleeding to the forward. Uh, to the front of the of the um, of the pro base, and we decided to add that to the silk screen art. I think you can see that in the left image here, where he decided to continue that bleed. Now, having those two um, helped us a lot uh, with two particular projects uh, that we had. You know, during the pandemic, our budget wasn't that large, and we had we needed some um, equipment in order to do our work. But we find quite old equipment uh, that we could use that was either half broken or you know partially working, and we use these tools on those two devices, which I will show later. Um, we've also created the unbreak um, when we got mobile phones in. Um, just like the Oyster, it is a, a QFP based design. Um, it's for QFP 48, 64, 100, and 144 pins. Um, it's 3.2 by 3.2 centimeters. It's got a VCC bus, bus on the top edge and a ground bus on the bottom edge. Um, that is so you can create, you can bridge. Um, to the relevant pads with solder and on the bottom you can add uh, decoupling capacitors where you need them uh, between the bus and the pads on the bottom it's got a prototyping area for 0201 sized smd components salvaged from mobile phones and i experiment with this a lot as you can see, um, these are, we also have a lot of prototypes of these available. Send us a message and we'll send them to you. Um, as you can see here, um, we've got uh, the pinouts of uh, the different footprints that are combined here. So. The orange one is the 144 pin one. The blue one is the 100 pin. 64, the, the um, egg yellow is the 64 pin one. And the light orange one is 48. This is, by the way, documentation you can find on our wiki. Um, we update the wiki regularly. So once we've open sourced all of this and or you've received one from us, uh, you can consult our wiki and find this documentation. Now, when it comes to application, obviously, um, these tools are still quite limited to um, what you want to, what you might want to use it for. Um, there are the, the usefulness is quite limited. Um, these tools, however, have been developed within uh, all of them within a few days. And we hope to create more tools. Um, so we have a large set of open source tools that you can use for reverse engineering e-waste and that you can consult our wiki and our uh, soon to be open to GitLab repo um, if you ever need any tools to reverse e-waste. Also, if you have any ideas on how to use these tools differently, we would love to hear from you. Now we've used these tools um, internally for our little IBM info window. We need, I needed a, a, a monitoring tool. I didn't have much around and I still had this. So made sure it worked again. We used the probes for this. Um, 
And with these probes, we got this working again. Whereas before it was laying uh, on the ground and now it's working. Uh, we use this really old logic analyzer uh, a lot. <laughs> it's a very comfortable tool to use uh, next to RDS Logic Pro. Um, but personally, I find this way more comfortable to use. It wasn't fully functional and we were able to create a, our custom firmware for this device. Um, and now we use it daily. So that's kind of it. Um, it's a kind of a shorter talk than I expected. Um, if you know you have any um, ideas on uh, what you would like to use these tools for, if you have any um, ideas on which kind of uh, uh, um, what kind of e-waste you commonly encounter and you need help with with reversing. Uh, we'd be willing to talk to you and very willing to talk to you and help you out and create tools that you might be useful to you. Um, our website is on binary. Um, our wiki is on binary.be and you can follow us on Twitter at on, on binary. Thanks. Hey, thank you. That's fantastic. Those are absolutely beautiful tools. I'm totally, there you go. Now I'm back. Those are absolutely fantastically beautiful tools. I'm shocked at the kind of the, the broad range of them you guys have got already. Do you take submissions from other people? If other people are working on kind of similar open source tooling, are you yeah. open to looking into it? Yes, the more the merrier. Uh, it, as as a, have been having been a lurker for you know a, a lot of years, and seeing the amount of talent of people uh, that 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 are on Hackaday, um, I would love to uh, see what people think and uh, uh, be open to suggestions, but also to designs. We'd love to collaborate with everybody. Yeah, those That's probes what are what these are for. Yeah, those probes are fantastic. And I love the idea of like the, the multi probe board with all those, with all the SMAs on it. That's really, really sweet. I also think that I forgot the ground layer because I'm a dad and I was kind of tired is the best excuse I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Maritz, for doing this. That was a really great talk. Thank you. And thanks to the community. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. All right, and everybody, every, every, all right, and everybody else, stay tuned, don't go super far. In about 15 minutes at the top of the hour, Matt Venn will give me, be giving his talk on the last year of his experience making open source ASICs. So definitely come back for that. You've got about 10, 15 minutes right now. Get a drink, chill out, hang out in the uh, Discord, and then come back for Matt's talk at the top of the hour. See y'all then.
All right, we're going to do some sound checks. If you're still watching the live stream, just ignore us. Uh, Jasmine Brackett is our next MC. Jasmine, do you want to test your microphone out when you get a chance? Hello, can you hear me okay? Yep, you sound very good. Um, I don't know if I can see video. Oh, I have my video. There you go. Um, can you see your own video? No, let me see if I can get a preview. You look good and you have a background on. Oh yeah, now I can see myself. Angie, is there a way for the person that's that's uh, sharing the countdown video to see the oh show pan show video panel? There we go. I got it. Yes, your video looks great. I love your background. All right, and then I'm going to mute myself and go see if uh, our next speaker is available. Uh Matt, when you're ready, if we could do a quick AV check, if you could turn on your video and unmute yourself. How's that? That is great. So you can go ahead and remute um, until it is time to get started. Thank you. Okay.
Hello and welcome back to Emoticon. I'm Jasmine Brackett and I run Tindy Hackaday's Hardware Marketplace. Uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker who is a science communicator and electronic engineer. Although we're both from the UK, I think I first met him at Bay Area Maker Fair around 2015, where he gave me this very, very, I don't know if you can see it, very cute, no, my background's, oh, I'll take a picture and put it in the Discord. Uh, super cute monster to a uh, lead solder monster. Since then, a lot has happened, uh, especially in open source ASIC and particularly in the last year. We're excited to have Matt Venn speaking at Remoticon this year. I hope you enjoy his talk, Open Source ASICs, A Year in Perspective. Cool. There you go. Yes, thanks. Welcome, yeah, that was Matt. a nice monster PCB. <laughs> One of my early ones. <laughs> I, I've had it for a very long time now. There you go. Cool. Oh, yeah, bit. Nice to see you. Anyway. Uh... Yes. Okay, we're live. So do I just, do I start now? Yes, you do. Okay, great. So yes, Hackaday Remoticon. Nice to see you all. Shame it's not Supercon, but um, we've got Remoticon, Remoticon instead. Can I get a mic check in the channel? Is my levels okay? Not too loud, not too quiet. Let's see. Nobody is saying anything. Oh, there's this 10 second lag anyway, isn't there? So yeah, so um, yeah, so probably quite a few of you saw my um, Remoticon from last year, 02 ASIC demo where I uh, showed the uh, open source ASIC tools in full effect. And that talk is still available on the YouTube channel. Um, nice mug shop, level perfect, spot on, works great. Excellent, okay, I'll stop watching that now. Oh, otherwise it will distract me. Um, yes, and um, yeah, a lot has happened. So um, I went from zero to ASIC myself um, and I've just uh, done my third tape out, so I've done three chips now. Still haven't got any, but um, I'll explain more as we get along. And um, the title of my talk is called Open Source ASICs, A Year in Perspective. And I'm going to try to keep this broad, not just about my experience, but about other people's experience, and um, also about uh, different kinds of initiatives going on around the world. And I'll take these off now as well. So now I'm going to share my screen. There we go. Okay, I've got my laser turned on. Everything is looking good. So uh, just a little um, recap. I've got to start the timer as well. Um, I originally got interested in the ASIC tool flow when I saw um, uh, Tim Edwards from eFabless presenting a design he'd done with Qflow, which is a, a tool chain that um, he maintains. And I ran one of my FPGA designs uh, through that and got a GDS and posted that on Twitter. And that was cool. Um, but probably it would have ended there had it not been for the announcement um, by Tim Ansell in June on the Fossey dial-up talk, talking about the open source PDK, uh, the new open source tool chain, and a free shuttle opportunity. So I looked into how much it costs to get a, a chips made and it was like $20,000. So I kind of thought, oh, well, I'm not gonna do that then. And then Google said, okay, we're gonna sponsor um, six shuttles and they'll be free as long as your design is open source. So I was totally on board with that. So I uh, immediately ran my uh, VGA clock FPGA design through the open lane tools, uh, got result out of that. Um, worked hard to kind of work out what the limitations and how to install the tools, uh, worked on a demo for Emoticon. Uh, there was loads of uh, love on Twitter for learning more about that. So that was really great. Um, and actually, I wanted to say thanks to all the people who watched the Emoticon talk and uh, uh, gave me uh, support and encouragement to make my course, which I've done this last year, because um, I probably wouldn't have done that without the encouragement. And then I did my first tape out in December, and that was with Eve, with eFabulous. So I have the we've got the open source PDK, and what that is is like a big database of all the things you need to uh, know to be able to make a chip. So the 
uh, the models, the timings, the parasitics, kind of uh, how thick the traces need to be, the DRCs. If you've ever done PCB designs before, you've got all these rules, like how close the metal needs to be and, or uh, if like metal is overlapping, then that's a DRC problem. So you have the same thing with uh, designing microchips, but it's maybe like 5,000 different rule checks for a, a process like 130 uh, nanometers, like the Skywater one. We had the open source uh, tool chain open lane, where the idea is you put your design in, uh, in your hardware description language like Verilog and out the end comes uh, GDS. And the GDS is the file that you send to the foundry. And in this case, that's Skywater, and then they make the chips. And the it's kind of about 40 layers for the Skywater PDK. So a bit more complicated than the PCB and a lot smaller as well. Um, and so uh, we did, we had this opportunity for a tape out. Um, this is on the side here, but I think um, number five was my VGA clock. So one of the things that was surprising to me was just how small this stuff is. Um, and so uh, I got some friends of mine to get involved. So I did three of these and had five other people. And then block number nine was a multiplexer. So the Pico RV32 Risk V processor living in this block here that's provided by eFabless, as well as the pad frame or the IOs, um, that enables the different projects to have access to all the IO pins. So they're not having to kind of share all the IO pins. They get complete access when they're switched on. Um, so yeah, one other thing I should mention is this, these slides will be available and everything, there's loads of links here to get involved and uh, follow what you're interested in. So uh, just uh, check the slides out at the end if you're interested. So looking a bit deeper into MPW1, uh, they had, there was 40 slots. Uh, so um, it's a really fantastic opportunity because um, the, the mask set for a wafer is about $200,000. And the way that you make that more affordable is you do a multi-project wafer. So you get 40 designs on there, and then you split the cost between all those 40 designs. But Google is covering the cost for that. So that kind of really lowers the barrier to actually get silicon in hand. It was oversubscribed, um, but they did find a way to make them all. And uh, really, um, amazingly, 60% of the designs were by uh, new designers, people who'd not done ASIC designs before, uh, and that includes me. And this was my design. And then these other ones with the uh, pink highlights were designs by people that I later interviewed. So if, uh, if you want to find out more about those, then you can check my website. My personal faves from MPW1 is um, the Pi 5 USB peripheral uh, designed by Sylvain Minot, TNT. Um, he was on Hackaday recently for his Doom on an uh, ICE 40 FPGA. Um, and this is a really cool bit of um, uh, work here. It's a microcoded USB stack. So the idea is with the firmware of the Pico RV32, you can specify how you want the USB device to work and that configures all the endpoints. But then the, uh, the hardware design and these uh, blocks of memory here do all the buffering and all the hard timing. So I'm really hoping to use that in my own projects in the future. And then on the analog side, uh, pick uh, Thomas Parry's five gigahertz satellite transceiver. Um, this is a really beautiful looking bit of analog layout, which is a, a PLL. And it's a nice bit of mixed signal. You've got a bit of digital stuff that is configured with the RISC-V processor and that sets up this PLL. And the interviews are there. Now, another thing that I want to mention is Open RAM. So um, OpenRAM provides the uh, SRAM blocks. We've got two kilobytes of SRAM down here in the corner. And we need this really because if you don't have a RAM generator, then you're forced to use uh, flip-flops. So you, Yosis, if you're used to any kind of FPGA stuff, you make a register and then Yosis uh, synthesizes it out of 32 flip-flops. And you see how big they are compared to a bit cell. So Matt Goodhouse presented at Fosse Dial-Up again. There was this great series of talks. I really recommend it, um, showing how OpenRAM works. It's parametric. You can have like dual port, single port, different sizes. Um, they included two kilobytes of SRAM uh, for the management area. We unfortunately don't get access to that from the user project area, although that is something that we're working on. I'll talk more about that later. So we thought we'd finished with the tape out, but in fact, um, there was a problem. 
Google had paid for a, um, an expensive tool called Calibre. So they had one license of that running on a Google server. And when they ran the designs that we submitted through it, it picked up some DRC errors. And here we've got these horizontal lines here that are uh, power in ground, providing power to the uh, macro block. So if you imagine my VGA clock, maybe this is a counter bit coming up, uh, getting rooted on metal five, going down through a wire and then going on metal four again. And then it was short circuited to the power or ground here. So it was gonna cause a, a terrible problem. Um, and the Calibre program spotted that. So we were able to go back, fix this stuff. It was a problem with the configuration of the tools we needed to turn off to make sure it doesn't root on uh, Metal 5. Uh, in February, I had fun pretty printing uh, GDS files. So the 2021 has been the year of sharing GDS files. So if you're an ASIC designer, you've probably got a, a photo or a, a, um, a printout on your wall of your latest chip. But you're not really allowed to share that because you're having to um, sign an NDA. You're not allowed to share this information. And I had a lot of fun um, coming up with color schemes and printing things out and making badges like this one. Um, uh, yeah, really enjoyed that. March, we had Strive come back. So Strive was a test chip that eFabless brought up. Um, and that tested um, a bunch of the kind of management stuff that is going to uh, come with every um, chip that you make. So like I mentioned before, we've got the pad frame, we've got some SRAM, we've got a RISC-V processor and all that stuff gets bundled for us by eFabless. Um, so we can put our design in the middle and then we get this support, uh, user logic analyzer, be able to configure the GPIs, so GPIOs, that kind of stuff. So they tested a bunch of that. Um, they sent that off in 2020. We got the chips back in March, 2021. And uh, we've got the obligatory blinky here. So that kind of showed that everything was working. That gave us good confidence of the tool chain and everything was working. Um, in May, um, Chip Ignite uh, was launched. So that's a commercial version of the free shuttle launched by eFabless, um, which is $10,000 for 300 parts, which works out at roughly 33.333 recurring uh, dollars per part. Um, $10,000 $10, is still a lot, but it's quite interesting because um, if you could share that space with a bunch of other people, say 16 different designs, then your cost for entry to get guaranteed silicon is down to 625. Um, so just um, to make it clear that the Google have sponsored this free shuttle and your design needs to be open source down to the GDS. It's a lottery system, so if there's more than 40 for a shuttle, then they have to pick the ones that go in. But this is a paid version where you're guaranteed the silicon and your design doesn't have to be uh, open source. And this is maybe half the price that it was when I first started looking at the possibility of taping out on my own. Um, so that the Chip Ignite program has been used a lot by universities. Uh, they were some early customers. And we've also seen the Open Source FPGA Foundation launching an initiative called Tape Out World. Uh, that's been launched in several countries. It's a university program. Uh, they recruit a champion in the university that um, builds it up and uh, helps with the training. Um, and then they use Chip Ignite to tape out projects. So the furthest they've got along so far is in Pakistan, where they've got 400 students uh, trained up, and now they're going to tape out 12 projects. So that's uh, super exciting. Great to see academia getting on board with that. In June, we had MBW2, the second tape out. Uh, we had 39 out of 40 slots filled. Uh, you can check this link to see a list of all the projects. Um, uh, my faves I'll talk about a bit uh, later on. Uh, this was the design that I taped out down here. Uh, one thing that's quite interesting is when you look at these, you can kind of tell the difference between analog designs because they're the really empty white ones and the digital ones, which are the ones that are kind of completely full up. Um, so, um, yeah, so by this time I'd, I'd made my course, I had some people on the course and we'd uh, taped out uh, two of my designs and 14 designs from people on the course. Um, things were much improved. I uh, wrote some tools. I had such a scary time with MPW1 because I was basically doing everything by hand. And this is a, a Python tool that aims to automate everything. So it can run all the tests on all the designs. It can check the firmware. It generates the configuration file. It does a whole bunch of different things. 
and and then you can just run a make uh, command and it you get the final gds that you can then apply to efabulous um so that was really fantastic super proud of that getting so many people through this a lot of people there really had come from zero with not even any digital design so it was really good to see them go all the way through to the end my top picks of mpw2 um it's always difficult to choose uh, favorites but fuse risk is awesome this is using the fabulous fpga framework which is a parametric fpga fabric uh, sitting in between two risk five processors um, and one of the cool things about fabulous fpga is it kind of comes with automatic support for yosis and next pnr so they're expecting to just be able to uh, load a bitstream straight into this and be able to uh, accelerate stuff between these two processors. Um, and I think it's, it's kind of easy to think like, okay, you've got your risk five processor, you've got a bit of FPGA fabric, and you've got some mixed signal like the radio transceiver we've seen from Thomas Parry, and there's some really powerful stuff we can start doing here. Uh, we saw the award winning bit serial uh, risk five processor from Ulof. Um, and that was uh, turned into a system on chip by class and um, called subservient and uh, a nice project by Lakshmi, who I had previously interviewed for her PLL project on MPW1 and she taped out an analog neuron project. So a little uh, word on the work that class did class and um, Ulof worked on a open lane extension for Edelize which is uh, like a whole framework that is meant to make it easy so that you can choose a different target open lane uh, and then your designs can get pushed all the way through to open lane uh, or if you change the target you can simulate or, on very later or you can change the target and then uh, burn it onto an FPGA. Uh, so uh, Ulof wrote that up on this blog post that's a good thing to check out. Um, we had some amazing artwork, so really put my artwork to shame, and now I shamelessly use all of his artwork in my own kind of um, marketing stuff for my course. Uh, Maximo Balestrini did some really great stuff by working out how to convert GDS to STLs, import that into Blender, and then come up with great color schemes. And he's done some really nice images, but also some animations that show how the layers kind of come together and also uh, animations on how these things uh, actually work. Uh, at the same time, we had um, LibreSoc being taped out. So this is interesting because it's not on Skywater and it's not using OpenLane. And I wanted to put this in to just kind of make sure that people can see that it's it's easy to uh, focus just on one set of tools. But this is really things are changing, and um, it's it's not just happening with those tools. We've got Coriolis two that is like an open lane equivalent that does automatic uh, design to GDS. It wasn't taped out on Skywater. It was funded by NLNet. Um, it's a whole SOC that's aiming to be an open source computer processor. Um, yeah, really impressive project. Definitely uh, check that out if you're interested. Luke Layton, who's uh, really involved in that, did a talk for open tape out and you can check that on this link. So then we've got some SRAM characterization by Andrew Zonenberg. Uh, he came up earlier in the Discord chat talking about uh, probes, and uh, he was putting his um, performance test gear to use in his skills to design this reusable characterization board. So we're using OpenRAM, um, and we, we're using it a lot, but we don't really know how it's going to perform exactly on Sky 130. So we really need to kind of be taping out these test structures and doing measurements We've got open RAM. We want to know how fast it can run, how low a voltage, how high a voltage, um, what the, all this kind of extra stuff. So um, we've got this daughter board here where the um, ASIC goes on. That plugs on to this um, main board here with a FPGA, some memory, um, an STM microcontroller. And luckily, he's got all the parts now. That took a long time to get the parts. Um, the boards were sponsored by OSH Park, so shout out to OSH Park. Thanks, Drew. Um, I've interviewed him. We've done two parts so far on the kind of the, the, the design and what we're trying to measure. And then part three is going to be coming soon, the results. July, I uh, did an experiment. So this is kind of a bit silly, but um, I'm still quite pleased with it. So this is my VGA clock again. And I wanted to do an OSHW certification of 
the circuit board, the firmware, and the ASIC all the way down. So on this board, we've still got the flash chip, which isn't open source, but um, everything else is. Uh, so I'm uh, claiming world first on this as a kind of uh, a silly gambit. Um, feel free to correct me if it's not. Um, and maybe we'll see an OSHW uh, new category for ASICs. Watch this space. August, we had an update from Sam Zalouf, um, who is awesome. <laughs> you probably all know him from um, Hackaday and his YouTube channel. Very, very interesting work, very impressive. And this is his second IC. So he's now at a, a 10,000 nanometer gate width. So the sky water is 100, and, although it's sky 130, the gate width is actually 150 nanometers. But uh, there's a big difference here. But he's managed to now uh, do 1,200 transistors um, in his garage. So very, very impressive uh, project. And I'm really interested to see how that goes, what happens next there. Um, one of the really interesting things that is uh, happening through the open source tools is um, we can put these things on the internet. We can put them on the cloud. We can share the GDS. We can share our designs. And that means we can use things like GitHub Actions. Uh, so the Caravel user project, which is the kind of the submission framework that we use with eFabulous, uh, we can have a GitHub Action that will install the PDK, build the GDS, and then run some tests. And um, Ant Micro have also done, they've done a lot of work, actually. I encourage you to check out their blog. Um, but one of the interesting things they've done is they've got a GitHub action that you can just subscribe to, and that will run a linter on your Verilog. Uh, so uh, really good to see this stuff happening. Hopefully, we'll have some GitHub actions that you can just attach to your repository. And then when you push your Verilog, you'll get your GDS in a format that's ready to tape out. I know that's part of Tim Ansell's dream. So in October, exciting times, we've got MPW1 silicon arrived. So it took longer than expected because uh, we had the DRC problems in uh, January and the whole kind of flushing the pipes, doing something new um, uh, took quite a long time, but we got our wafers back. Uh, then they were bumped. So it's a wafer level chip scale package. So it's a bit like a BGA. Um, so they're going to be a bit tricky to solder. Um, but hopefully not too hard. But sadly, we had some bad news. It was announced on this mailing list. And this is my um, uh, yeah, work in the YouTube thumbnails. I hope you like that. Um, if, it's, uh, if the story lives up to the, the clickbait thumbnail, then it's not really clickbait. It's just good marketing. So um, we had a, a problem with the clock tree for the management area. So there were hold time violations not detected. And that basically has kind of risen off the, the management controller part of the MPW1 chips, uh, which is really sad because it means that for most of the designs, we're not able to get a result out of it. Some people have uh, managed to, like analog projects, or if they're not dependent at all on uh, the Caravel um, management harness. But one of the problems is that to configure the GPIOs, we need that to work. So my designs in the middle could be working, but I never get access to them because I can't set the IOs up. So eFabless were working hard on fix is for MPW2. They resynthesized Caravel with the hold violations fixed. Chip Ignite, they'd already cut the masks. So they worked on quite an interesting project to fix the clock with a mask edit. And they're going to release some information about that. And then MPW3 was slightly delayed because we had to uh, update our tooling kind of mid tape out to uh, take those fixes. And if you want to uh, read more about that or watch the video, then check that link. Okie dokie. So um, Rapid Silicon got funded. Um, exciting time um, in the open source silicon world. Lots of people are doing startups and getting funded. This has come out of the Open FPGA uh, Foundation. Um, they're, uh, taped out this open FPGA fabric on MPW1, and that's part of the technology that they support. Um, and they're also involved in the tape out world um, initiative that I mentioned earlier. In November, we had the workshop of open source EDA technology, WOSET, and I was on the um, uh, review board there. Uh, very interesting papers, a lot of them doing interesting stuff and being able to not only um, 
uh, do interesting designs, but then also get those designs taped out uh, so that we can get the results back with the silicon. Uh, so again, it's very difficult to pick favorites. Uh, there's lots of interesting stuff there, but um, if I had to choose two, then I'd go for the programmable analog standard cell library. So this is something, the analog and the digital flow are very different. And one thing that people have tried a lot in the past is to have a kind of analog standard cell so that you've got this library you can build up. And this is a programmable standard cell that uses floating gates, really interesting paper. And then open cache, uh, which is a bit like open RAM, but instead of generating RAMs, it generates caches. Uh, all the papers and the video presentations are there. So then we had open tape out conference in November. Um, I helped to organize this and I was hosting it and we had loads of great speakers um, involved. You can um, watch it, it's was streamed to YouTube, but we recorded it all and it's all there now. Um, we had stuff on, uh, Tim Mansell did the keynote. Uh, we had an update on Open Road, which is the core of Open Lane. We had a bit of security talk from David Holton and Joe Fitzpatrick. David Holton taped out a um, electromagnetic fault injector uh, detector system on MPW2. Um, very interesting waveform analysis from Lucas Klemmer. Then on day two, we had an update from Mohammed Kasim, CTO of eFabulous, uh, some analog representation, Thomas and Pepine. Then Jean Paul Chapu and Luke Layton talked about Coriolis and LibreSoc. And then John McMaster finished off with a, a storming talk about the uh, MPW1 physical implementation. It was super, super cool to start seeing some die shots from open source. Uh, silicon and he's done a scanned um, a, a micrograph of one of the test chips and that's uploaded to his website that you can click on and zoom about in uh, so thanks a lot to him that got all done very very last minute so uh, yeah thanks to everybody involved there um, a little bit more on Coriolis too so this is uh, similar to open lane it's a fully automated rtl to gds flow so again you put your design in and you get your gds out um, it's kind of more python based than tickle based and jean paul chapeau is one of the lead architects on that project and he did a presentation at open tape out about it and you can check that link for more so mpw3 just uh taped out on monday so uh yeah it was a busy last couple of weeks um uh, the, we haven't had a finalization yet from eFabulous. It looks like uh, we filled all 40 slots, so hopefully everybody's design gets made. Um, one of the things that changed is that now things are more automated. So you upload your design with a kind of Git sync, then you run a check job, which checks all the DRC, checks your design is the right size, all these kinds of things. Um, and then it does a tape out job. And what that does is it does things like generates the fills and generates the IDs um, and prepares everything ready to send into the foundry and uh, everything going well we're expecting silicon back in April and all the fixes to the tools went in so hopefully we won't have any hold or timing problems um, with this run. So for um, the course submission, the zero to ASIC course submission from MPW3, I ran through a couple of my designs uh, from MPW1 because I wanted, uh, I think it's unlikely we'll get them to work, but so I wanted to take them out again. Uh, we had seven designs from the course and we've got some uh, secret uh, designs here that I can't possibly show you, um, but actually I can. So this is exactly the, the kind of thing that I saw when um, Tim Edwards showed us his uh, first uh, tape out that he did with um, um, Qflow. It probably wasn't this first, so I'm probably getting that wrong, but there was this um, gray box here because he couldn't share the SRAM and this is really fantastic. So now everything is open. We can share everything. Fantastic. Um, we, the multi-project tools are updated. I've had some good contributions from the community um, into that, especially I'd like to shout out to Pavel who helped me with open RAM support. So now Every time we tape out, we'll put um, a one kilobyte block of open RAM in the corner um, with a wishbone wrapper. So if any one of these designs wants to get access to some fast local cache for a frame buffer or from FIFO or um, whatever you want, then you've got it uh, here available and all the projects can share that. 
the idea is that each of the projects gets activated one at a time. Uh, so you can check out our application there. And I just wrote up a little blog post about it there to have a look at all the different um, designs. Um, yeah, there's some interesting stuff in there. My picks of MPW3, uh, we've got a very interesting one from um, our friend uh, Myrtle Gatecat Shah, who's been super involved with the open source FPGA movement. And they're now getting involved in the ASIC, um, open source ASIC movement. They did an SOC, they used Coriolis 2 for the place and route, uh, they used NMyGen for uh, the design instead of using Verilog, and they didn't use the standard cells, they made their own standard cells using FlexCell, I'll talk about that in a minute, but that's quite, a, quite an interesting departure, very interesting to see that. Um, I'm a sucker for nice looking analog, so this is one of my faves from MPW3 and A to D, and it's going to be great when we build up a library of reusable um, analog IP that we can use uh, to build our projects with. And something I'm really interested to find out about is this um, RISC-V Arduino compatible project that is aiming to make a uh, RISC-V compatible Arduino project. So hopefully I'll find out more about that uh, later. I've invited these, all these people for interview um, and uh, hopefully that will get posted on my channel soon. So FlexCell, this is a project from staff at Chips for Makers, and the idea is you uh, can load in the DRC rules from the process design kit, the PDK, and then it will generate you a library of um, standard cells, all the AND gates, the OR gates, all the kind of the basic digital logic stuff that you can then use um, in it for a digital design. And um, hopefully that is going to work with OpenLane and it, it works with Coriolis. Uh, so I'm suggesting that we uh, uh, make a 10,000 nanometer standard cell library for Sam and for his third chip, he can uh, start taping out some digital design. So I haven't told him yet, but watch this space. <laughs> and then in December, we've got um, MPW4. So we've got two tape outs really quickly. So um, there's probably going to be quite a lot of space on that because um, Everyone just taped out on MPW3. So if you've got an FPGA design handy and you want to try this out, now is a great time. Um, we're, uh, Skywater and eFabless are working on adding reram. So that's adding a new layer into the uh, Sky130 stack up that is going to give us resistive um, random access memory. And I don't really know much about that at the moment, except that it's non-volatile. Um, so that's going to be uh, quite an interesting new development that we all get access to. So what's happening um, in the future in 2022? Um, Google, so in Tim Mansell's keynote for Open Tape Out, um, he mentioned there's going to be more shuttles. So initially they said six. Um, we've had three this year, but now we've got confirmed another four next year and another three on another process. So that is great news. Um, they're going to reveal another foundry. Uh, they're adding more PDKs, so a 90 nanometer node, another 130 nanometers, and a budget 180. And we're seeing more and more investment in this place. So I already mentioned Rapid Silicon. Zero ASIC got funded. Zero ASIC isn't related to my course. That's one reason why I changed the name of my website. Uh, that's a different project. They're active on LinkedIn. Go and check them out. And eFabulous are also raising money. So one other thing that I want to try is, uh, can I salvage MPW1? Um, I was at the Hardware IO security conference. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm realizing I'm just at the end of my time here. Yeah, so you I, are. I think uh, this is, I've got three more slides. Can I finish them? I think we have to move on at the moment, but are you going to be in the Discord channel? Yeah, so I'll be in the Discord, yeah. So maybe you can uh, share um, it there. And I, yeah, I think so the let me just put my last slide up here. So uh, contact me on the Discord, ask any questions, check out these slides, uh, join the newsletter and talk to me on Twitter. Fantastic. Thank you. Welcome back. Are we starting up right now? Okay. Well, welcome back again. Uh, we're 
Our next speakers created the fashion at tech studio Amped Atelier as a way to explore modern fabrication techniques and interactivity in clothing through the medium of wearable art, which is of particular interest to me, if anybody, if any of you know me. I hope you all enjoy their talk as much as I will. I welcome Sarai Cohen and Hal Rodriguez as they share details about conductive melody as tech-couture instrument. Hello. Hi. 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 <laughs> we, okay, I guess we can start the presentation. Let's do share screen. Thank you. And there we go. Well, welcome. We're really excited to be able to talk about our piece, Conductive Melody. I'm Sarai, and this is Hal. Um, together, we have a little wearable tech tour design studio called Ant Atelier. Um, so we started this piece in 2019 as part of Make Fashion, which is a group out of Calgary. Um, and this was for a presentation at Beakerhead, which is a science and art and music festival in Calgary. One of the things that we like to create are um, wearable garments that have interactivity. So um, both of these examples I have up here on the screen are, um, one is a piece that has a color sensor. So the model can change the color of the lights in the garment, they're 3D printed lights. Um, and she can change that with the color sensor using um, different objects. And then on the right hand side is um, a piece that we made for a dancer that has an accelerometer and She's controlling the speed and the color and the um, action of the lights on this garment through her dance moves. So um, it's kind of really important to us that the garments we make are not just pretty flashy lights, although that's fun too, but they can be controlled by the person that's wearing them or they can be controlled by you know, um, sensors that interact with the environment or even the audience. So some of the pieces we make have Bluetooth and they can be controlled by the audience as well. So when we were thinking about this design and thinking about how to make a essentially wearable instrument. So I like to play around with electronics and make garments and do costuming and how really like synthesizers and kind of electronic music. And we were thinking about what are some examples of um, essentially musical instruments and, and how we could fit those onto a garment. Um, so one of the things I was thinking of were harps, you know, large stringed instruments. And um, this is an example of a historical garment, um, kind of medieval um, houblons and other kinds of garments that have really large sleeves. And that would give us plenty of room to do kind of a conductive fabric interface for this. And then other examples that we can look at are pianos, which also have kind of a, um, a keyboard that you can touch and then kind of strings extending from that with hammers that are making the, the musical notes and um, kimonos that have also very large sleeves that provide a lot of space to make this interface. Um, there's been some wearable instruments that are kind of drum kits. Um, there's a drum hoodie that people have made and other kinds of ones, but I wanted to make sure that there was enough room um, for the the wearer to really demonstrate that they were playing that instrument and also to be able to kind of make it a performance. So they're performing the music and they're performing the garment. So I start all of my pieces by essentially doing a design sketch. Um, some of these are rougher than others. You can see on the right that there's one that's basically just like a, a humanoid shape that has kind of ideas of what this garment might look like. And usually if it's a piece that we're going to make, I develop it into um, more of a, a complete design sketch. So on the, on the left-hand side, I have an example that would kind of use a kimono-inspired sleeve with these metallic um, kind of scrolly Baroque or floral interface that I wanted to use um, for the wearer to do the interactive music. And then as I produce a piece, I typically do a mock-up um, for those who make wearables or garments, this is typically called a muslin. Um, it uses a very thin cotton fabric um, and it's intended to 
you know, just see how the garment might fit. I do this through a combination of drafting using measurements from the body and then also draping. So here I've made a piece that has, you know, a sleeve, um, a bodice and a skirt. And then because I wanted to make it a little bit different than some of the dress type garments that we made before, I added some leggings um, to kind of give it a different look. And then as that comes together, I usually choose fabrics. Um, one of the things that I really like to do for my garments for like tech couture is to use couture techniques and materials. So for example, this garment is made out of silk. Um, I just think that it helps, you know, when you're gonna do a one-off creation, it really helps to pay attention to those details. And another design um, style that I like is to kind of hide my electronic components. So um, in the center here, there's a semi-sheer neck piece with sequins and beading. And, and some of my electronic components for my lights are going to go behind that. Here's an example of the couture techniques that I use inside the garment. I find that this helps them wear better and just makes a more beautiful and complete project. I've um, bound the seam allowances and bias. I have a netting piece that contains um, the light strands that I'm going to use and that's sewn onto the other, the, the main garment so that it can be removable. Um, definitely something I think about a lot in making wearables is how will this be worn? How will it be washed? Um, how can somebody care for it? One of the materials that we really like to use are conductive fabrics, tapes, and thread. Um, so I've made conductive pom-poms, um, all sorts of sewn garments that have conductive thread. For this, I wanted the um, conductive interface to be very large. And I used a conductive fabric. This was you know, fairly easily acquired. It has, um, I believe, steel woven through it and is colored copper. And it is a, a mostly a polyester fabric. So what I did was I bound the fabric to, with heat and bond, and that has an adhesive on both sides. So it binds the conductive fabric to the silk. And then using um, design software Illustrator, we drew these kind of organic, almost Art Nouveau interfaces that um, kind of replicate the strings of a harp, and then cut them out on a laser cutter, and then bonded them onto the silk. And so this is what formed kind of the interface, the conductive fabric interface for our instrument. Yeah. So this is what's going on in the dress. We have, um, as Sarai mentioned, the, the essentially the the main uh, interface, the main control area is the sleeve. And the sleeve is, uh, the, the copper looking fabric is, 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 is basically sensed by uh, uh, a capacitive time splinter. We're using, I think, a uh, breakout board made by, I think, Adafruit. Uh, and it all communicates, the touches are all communicated to a small Arduino. The small Arduino controls the lights on the dress. So as, as notes are played, You'll start to see you see the lights all light up in sync with the thing because they're they're responding basically to the touch as well. Uh, there's lights on both the front and the back of the dress, and that's all controlled by Arduino, which actually lives in the sleeve. Now the the um, the machine. So we're also we're also turning the eight the eight essentially the eight little strips into a wider range by expanding out into the music by using uh, a Raspberry Pi running. Uh, a machine learning model put out by TensorFlow Project Magenta called Piano Genie. Piano Genie essentially takes eight inputs and expands that out musically into what would encode, would be um, an 88 uh, piano keyboard. The output from that, from the Raspberry Pi, is essentially, uh, originally we were using audio, but this time we decided to actually pump out to uh, MIDI. Uh, the idea is that we'll have, um, rather than rely on wireless mics, we'll rely on Bluetooth MIDI or an, another kind of uh, MIDI over the air to basically have a, a standalone dress that can be performed. The Raspberry Pi is actually hidden in the ruffles uh, of the dress in the back. Uh, everything's powered by just a, a good old um, uh, phone battery, and it seems to work fine. So uh, to get if people are a little bit interested to see what goes on underneath. Essentially the Raspberry Pi is running Magenta uh, using a JavaScript library. So we're running it within a node app. And all that basically happened there is it's reading in serial from the Arduino 
uh, just essentially byte data because we have eight eight control eight, eight little individual controls. So it's coming in as a byte. We try, we we parse that out. We run it through piano genie to take a input from one of the buttons to actually get a MIDI note, and then that gets output as as MIDI. So the the fun thing about that is that the um, if we hit a particular note, you'll you'll hear that it's essentially not the same note every time. It'll change, uh, and that's essentially the model which has been trained on uh, on classical music pieces to actually expand that melody, expand those eight buttons into something that is actually a little sounds a little bit more melodic. Uh, and I think we would like to do a, a little demo, so we're gonna. We're gonna we're gonna stop screen sharing. And is that? Oops. There we go. Okay. Go for it. So one of the things that you'll notice as we play this, and I'm going to let it um, not play for a while, is we wanted both a musical output and kind of a light output so that um, people could experience this garment both ways, um, both visually and um, through music. So if you'll notice, I'm not playing the garment right now, and we're getting kind of more of these white and yellow tones, and the lights aren't turning on very quickly. And then as soon as I start playing, we get more of these pink and blue tones, and there's a lot more activity that happens on the garment. And because it's all MIDI, we basically uh, allowed, we basically are able to switch the instruments on the fly really easily. Uh, for example, we can switch to a uh, another instrument. Let's try this one. A cello sound. <laughs> But that's that's all the the magic of MIDI. Oh, and yeah. Yeah. We can also introduce a. Uh, a little backing soundtrack as well. Yeah. All right. So some lessons learned about the construction of this garment. Um, uh, we've done several things with conductive fabric, and it does need to be stored carefully um, because you can run into issues where if you make um, parts of the connection too thin, or um, if you use a silver fabric, it might tarnish and you'll lose some of the connectivity. Um, so it won't be as conductive. You might not be able to play all parts of your garment. 
-hmm. You want to talk about software? Um, the software, the software we're running in Raspberry Pi were, were, you know, the biggest problem we had initially was getting good quality sound out of the Pi. Just relying on the the, the built-in audio system, the Raspberry Pi gave us sound that was a little clicky, uh, and also uh, we didn't have. Um, we also decided to move off over to MIDI just because we can rely on external sound modules that can be plugged in directly into a soundboard at a, either a, like at a show or a theater fest or, or a music venue, um, kind of separated just the, the music generation out of the piece, just to make what runs on the dress uh, a little bit more um, manageable, uh, stable, and uh, just to leave the dress as essentially a controller. Um, but yeah, I think that's, you know, it's been fun. Um, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that is our talk. Unless there's anything else. Um, so thank you very much for listening. <laughs> if you have any questions about um, conductive fabrics or any of the, the electronics or music that we used or the components that we used for this project, um, how we'll be hanging out in the Discord. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to answer some questions for you. Mm -hmm. I guess we'll we'll play it out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate you speaking with uh, Remote Connie again. <laughs> so um, we're going to uh, be back in a little while, um, and we're, we're, we're with Jay Bowles. Thank you. Copy, can you hear me? I can hear you. Excellent. Okay, I was just making sure I was in the right thing. Didn't want to interrupt 
a presentation. No, you're good. Thanks for turning up early. Absolutely. That's weird. Feel free to test out anything you'd like, but this is being streamed. Excellent, thank you. Okay. Camera seems to be more zoomed in than my previous trials. So I'm trying to figure out what's going on here. Hmm. Have you found any current feed with past presenters where is the, is the screen just zoomed in prior to the live talk or is this current feed that we see right now going to be the, the main feed uh, framing wise? Um, I think Angie may be able to answer that one. It should be the same. Um, Jay, from our trial, you look relatively the same to me as when you and I had done the trial. Is my head cut off currently? Yes. Just at the very top. Mm, interesting. Okay. Need to move the camera. Still not much better, but you know what? I'll work with it. I, uh, I don't know why it's zoomed in extra right now. It was much more zoomed out. Let's see. Ah, that could be why. Much better. And now you see with room above my head, correct? Yes. And my audio incredibly, is it coming from this location? Sure is. Figured out that demonic audio problem. Excellent. Jay, unless you're um, testing some audio, I'm going to turn up yours, you, you, you know. Uh, turn mine off? Yep. Okay, I'll do so.
Jasmine and Jay, I'm going to go ahead and turn off video until we start in eight minutes. Will I be pinged on Discord? I can do that. OK.
Hello and welcome back to Remoticon. Uh, my name is Jasmine Brackett, I'm, I run Tindy, and I'd like to introduce our next guest. Uh, you may have seen uh, the Plasma channel on YouTube focusing on high voltage physics. Its host and creator um, is Today will be furthering his long-term goal of inspiring development in plasma physics by sharing high voltage experiments with you today. He'll demonstrate a little how physics shapes the worlds around us and why the future lies in plasma physics. Please enjoy Jay Bowles as he takes you for a dip into the plasmaverse. Let me uh, put the spotlight on you, Jay. Oh, there you go. Excellent. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate that. We can. Um, you stole my. You stole my tagline there. I was gonna, I was gonna plug the the title name there, but thank you for doing it anyways. But really, good title. Yeah, yeah. Really excited to be here. Like, really grateful to be able to share my passion with everybody at Hackaday and also everybody who's watching here because what you're about to see is going to be some custom chosen situations and experiments and uh, scientific processes that I've kind of discovered or figured out over the past 17 years. So what you're about to see is a lifelong passion of mine that I've had since I was 15. So, oh, wow, that's 18 years, 18 years. I've been doing this, everything, every high voltage application you can think of. And um, this presentation might be a little bit different from ones uh, you might have seen earlier today. I'm going to switch between uh, a PowerPoint presentation with some information I want to share and um, also some live demonstrations here at the table, which it looks like my framing is a little wonky, but we'll we'll work with that. We'll work with that. And uh, yeah, really, really excited to be able to share my passion. Uh, I don't have a degree in engineering. I don't have a degree in plasma physics. I have a degree in science and I am self taught for about 18 years uh, through doing this through almost daily or, or weekly occurrences. Uh, but yeah, I have three specific demonstrations I want to show you that hopefully kind of get the gears turning for you know if i can inspire just a couple of people to make you start questioning what's possible with plasma physics or high voltage physics then i have had a good day and um you know with that being said and thank you for just for for stealing my uh my title line there but i think it's time for us to take a dip into the plasmaverse and quick note i have the powerpoint presentation skills of a seven-year-old so hopefully you guys like pictures because I really like pictures too. That's about where we're sitting at with skill level here. A quick, um, quick note about why I'm so passionate about plasma physics, high voltage physics in general. It's maybe I'm biased because I'm, I'm self-taught. I, I have self-taught engineering skills and I'm a maker, I'm a builder. Perhaps I'm biased from that, but I think high voltage physics is an extremely tangible field of science, you know, and, a lot of the things we've seen in the past that are remarkable that we now take for granted, and even a lot of things now that you walk around and, and take for granted currently, a lot of them are high voltage based, right? So let's give a couple examples here. It's extremely tangible because anytime you go past a, let's say a, a district with a neon signs, a bars, restaurants, whatever it is, neon sign, that's a noble gas inside of a, ga a glass tube ionized because of a high voltage current going through it. And the color of that neon sign is a result you know, the wavelength is a result of the mixture of gases you have inside of it. We all take that for granted. Radio communication, well, that started out as a high voltage endeavor. You know, good old Tesla himself and also Marconi, all the original radio transmitters in the past were spark gap high voltage transmitters. And then probably a very common example that is the most applicable to every single person, at least uh, in Western countries would be the microwave oven, right? You know, little Susie here, she likes her hot pockets. But little does she know, it's taking about one and a half thousand to two and a half thousand volts to create the microwaves to cook that food. But uh, Susie likes her hot pockets, you know. And then we also have particle accelerators. We have ionic propulsion. We have a lot of um, high voltage physics has a lot of implications for future use and directing us in a positive direction. However, as exotic as some of those are, uh, that's not really where my interest lies. My interest lies in particular, both on the YouTube channel and my personal interest for 18 years in really exotic applications. And like I said, I've, I've custom chosen three experiments I'm going to show that are exotic in my definition, uh, because high voltage applied in exotic situations nearly always produces an exotic result. And that's what I've found. This picture in the upper right hand corner of the fire into the hand, that is a still frame from a Discovery Channel episode. 
where I was demonstrating fire bending, which is one of the demonstrations I'll do today on a smaller scale. I have my computer right next to me, so I'm, I'm dumbing down that fire size a little bit for, for safety. Um, but you're going to see electrostatic fire bending. Now, that's what I'd consider a tangible real world application of high voltage. Also, lower left hand corner, as kind of the, the word suggests, cleansing ozone. Uh, last year, I made a, a device that will sterilize your hands with about five to seven seconds, and it is a complete sterilization. Uh, obviously, you don't want to sterilize your hands all the time, every day. That's not a good, good thing to do, but every once in a blue moon, uh, having the opportunity to completely sterilize a surface using high voltage corona, which is the purple stuff you're seeing in that picture, um, has some big advantages. Now, the first demonstration that I am really excited to show, uh, it's, it may work right away, it may not work right away, it's, it's extremely organic. It'll decide, it'll work if it, if it wants to. So hopefully in the first or second try, we'll get this electrostatic levitation going. But it allows me to teach a couple of concepts. First of all, high static voltage does not always equate to high lethality. Now, uh, what matters is leakage current or the actual current experienced across your body and you know, a time constant, there's a bunch of variables. So a high static voltage does not automatically mean that uh, it's a lethal voltage. Uh, to charge myself up, which I'll be charging myself to about 60,000 volts for two of these experiments, I will be using what's called a Cockroft Walton voltage multiplier, which uh, you'll see when I zoom the camera back out here shortly to the table, I'll point it out. Uh, I custom build these devices, I build them myself so I know that they're safe, which is why I'm gonna do this. <laughs> but it charges my body to 60,000 volts DC. Uh, the bottom plate you'll see in this picture, that's just a metal, uh, a metal plate, I forget where I get it, and it's attached to the electrical ground of the voltage multiplier. It's, in theory, a relative ground voltage, and I will end up charging myself up to 60,000 volts, and energy is essentially going to flow between my hand to that ground plate, but the mechanism that causes the energy flow uh, is also the mechanism that causes a piece of um, foil to levitate. So I would like to start off with, oh, oh so sorry, framing is off by a little bit here, but uh, this is the voltage multiplier. I have a bunch right off screen that are about 10 times bigger, but I prefer not to kill myself right now. Uh, now this produces 60 kilovolts. The output is on the top and it, a wire is connected from the top down to a uh, well insulated stool on the ground. On top of the ground, I've put some aluminum foil. So I will end up actually standing on top of this when the power is on. So I'm isolated from ground and charged about 60 kilovolts DC. And hopefully you'll see a bit of levitation. This is the example of that foil boat. That shape is very particular. So uh, it's a little harder to see right now, but those two sharp corners um, are very important on the base. It's not the only shape that works, but it is a shape that works pretty efficiently for the application I want to do. Uh, now I'm charged to 60 kilovolts and I've found that with this device I shock myself every time I turn it on. So I'm going to turn it on with a glass rod so I don't shock myself. And hopefully you will have a chance to see this work on the first time. And it is a really, really cool thing to see. Electrostatic levitation. Let's give it a try. Watch me shock myself. Oh, let's give this a second try. This was pretty normal part of this application right here. <clears throat> cool. Let's give it a try again. It's important that the top plate is completely parallel to the bottom plate at all times. This is a little bit off screen right now. But once it levitates, you will hopefully see it a little bit better. So my hand right here. Well, that is troublesome. It, uh, it actually decided to break right now. Let's, um, let's give this one a try, hold on. There we go. There we go. A little bit temperamental. Glad this is working. Okay. So this is, you can actually see a little bit of it spinning underneath my hand. It's, it's levitating right underneath my hand and it'll follow your hand even up and down a little bit to a certain extent. 
Now it's going to spin a little bit because that's its natural state of finding stability. It's a state called a quasi-stable equilibrium, and you can even choose to levitate it with the back of your hand. And if you've done the experiment just right, oh, not that time. Uh, really glad that power source did not break like I thought I had just done. But really interesting feeling where you can feel this tugging on the bottom side of your hand, and you can also feel a little bit of wind. And I'll talk about what that wind is. It's called ionic wind. But uh, there's a couple mechanisms on how exactly this works. Um, let me go back to our, our uh, PowerPoint here. So some observations about what you just saw and some, some blatant facts about how, how the mechanism is going to work. Uh, first of all, it's inherently a lossy system. So I don't know if you heard while I was talking, there was a hissing noise and also a high frequency noise. Uh, that's indicative of energy loss. And that hissing noise is uh, also indicative of energy leaving the system. So if you didn't have a constant input of power, uh, this system would, it would work for a split second, and that's about it. Now, what causes that levitation is a static pull and ionic, a static push and pull between the two plates, the ground plate in my hand, but also an ionic wind that causes thrust upwards, which again, I'll talk about. Um, but this is not stable by definition. By scientific standards, this is called quasi-stable levitation. It follows Earnshaw's theorem, which uh, dictates that a point charge within a static electric field could never be perfectly stable, only quasi-stable at best. So here's how it achieves quasi-stable levitation. Uh, stage one, my hand or the top plate in this, this picture you're seeing is negatively charged, severely negatively charged at a high voltage. That top plate repels electrons in the foil boat and the bottom plate is a relative positive voltage. It's a ground voltage, but compared to me, it's a positive voltage and it attracts electrons down. Well, the second stage is the electrons naturally accumulate at sharp points on the base of the boat. This is a natural inherent property of uh, high voltage physics of high voltage electricity is sharp points accumulate electrons at a higher rate. And because of that, those points will have much stronger electric field gradients around the corners. Uh, that higher electric field gradient will uh, cause the air to become ionized and electrons will actually fly off of the corners. And it's interesting, it depends on your polarity but I'm choosing to discuss the polarity where electrons fly off. But this creates ionic wind at the base. So, as I mentioned, there's an electrostatic push and pull, but there's also this ionic wind thrust component. And how does it self-regulate? Why doesn't it just shoot up to the top? Or why doesn't it just shoot out to the side? Well, let's look at the too high scenario. Um, actually, when it gets too high to the upper plate, my hand, it is too far away from the bottom plate to have much of an influence on the relative positive charge of the base. And contrary to what you think, it actually also loses its charge too quickly when it gets too, um, too high up there. Let's look at the too low situation. Uh, there's not enough negative plate influence on it because it's too far from the top now. And actually the boat becomes net positive and tends to be repelled back up uh, towards that negative plate. So it's a, it's a push and pull that um, it self-regulates, and uh, that's how it achieves a quasi-stable levitation. <clears throat> now, the second thing I want to show is, hopefully I don't uh, burn myself doing this like I've done a million times, but it's electrostatic firebending. It's using the same process. I'll be standing on a uh, electrically insulated stool, same thing, powered by the voltage multiplier, 60 kilovolts. But a quick note about, about how I discovered uh, how I discovered this fire bending. It, uh, I have much bigger voltage multipliers and I had a big one on and I had lit a candle and I walked past the voltage multiplier for, for whatever reason, I don't know why. And I noticed that the, the candle flame bent in exactly like this picture with my hand, but I didn't intend for it to happen. And I noticed, oh, that's strange. So I walked back towards the voltage multiplier and moved in closer and it pulled the flame off of the wick. And that's when I noticed something funky was happening that, okay, fire is easily influenced by an electrostatic charge because fire is an electrically conductive partial plasma. This is debatable in academia. Some sources will cite it as a plasma. Some will sort it not, uh, cite it not as a plasma. So I consider it to be a partially uh, electrically conductive partial plasma. 
um, those positive and ne negative ions inside of the fire is what allows it to be externally influenced. It's, it's super cool. Hopefully it works on camera here in a second. Again, body will be charged to about 60 kilovolts DC negative. The low camera angle right now will actually work in our favor for a second. But uh, again, I'll be charged 60 kilovolts DC. This plate is a ground, a relative positive voltage and the candle sits on the ground. Now, wax is a good insulator, but sitting on the ground plate, it does have a very relatively weak grounding connection. Oh, okay, the candle decided to show up. Excellent. That was about to be a very short demonstration. Um, now, I also wanted to do a larger demonstration, kind of like what you saw in that picture with it bending into my hand. Uh, I found that with so much equipment, so close, it, uh, it posed a lot of inherent risk. So we're going to do a candle, and as long as I can demonstrate that you can influence this, this fire with charges, hopefully you'll walk away with a couple of gears turning in your head. So normal candle. Let's zoom in here. Normal candle, not influenced whatsoever. Sure, you could, you could blow it around. It's influenced that way. But it's not influenced otherwise. But the moment then the object next to it is electrostatically charged to a high voltage, AKA my hand. Let's be, ah, that was too soon. That was too soon. That's okay. Now, hopefully you saw a little bit of that influence. That happened too soon. <laughs> Come on, relight. One more time. Again, I'm standing on that insulated stool. If I was not on an insulated stool, the past demonstration and this demonstration wouldn't work. I need to be off of the ground for this to work. So you've got influence to the left side. Hopefully you see that a little bit. Hard to see on camera here, I'm seeing. To the right side, okay. We've got, a, we've got a candle flame that's not wanting to behave, but um, I have a video on this. You can get a much larger flame. The maximum size I've gotten is about six, actually eight to 10 inches. Um, you can have it leap into your hand on the right, onto the left, but the explanation for how this candle flame is influenced by electrostatic fields isn't just as simple as, well, it's positively charged, I'm negatively charged, so it's attracted. It's actually much more complicated than that because I found you can reverse it and be uh, high positive voltage with that being negatively charged and you have the exact same impact. So it's not inherently just because of the ions inside of the flame. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the observations and lessons. I wanted to get to this slide because Unfortunately, you didn't get a very good example of that fire bending here on camera. It, um, it's a little hard to see and it blew itself out twice, but you can get it looking like this on the base. It can actually split in half. So it's okay, it's not positive or negative charge based entirely. That's just one of the elements. But uh, this poses an inherent danger, of course. You are attracting fire to your body. Um, not necessarily the safest thing, but the attractive effect is scalable. And like I said, I've gotten about an eight to 10 inch diameter bowl full of rubbing alcohol lit it on fire and it's actually able to bend towards your hands so it's scalable up if you increase the voltage of the object next to the fire aka your body but what's really important to uh take into account is oh, uh, apologies what's important to take into account is well can this be reversed can this effect be reversed that's what the world would be uh, beneficial to have that's what I would love to know. Can the effect be repulsive? Because the implications of repelling fire are much safer than the implications of attracting fire. So results are inconclusive at this time. The closest thing we have is ionic wind, which the uh, same exact thing I mentioned with the bottom of that foil boat, all it is is actual wind itself. So that's, that's not electrostatic repulsion. That's just wind blowing fire away. But um, I mentioned it's more than just the static charges that have an impact. It's also because the flame path may be following the electric field lines present between your hand 
and the grounded plate that the candle is sitting on. Now fire is uh, in a lot of regards, so it's lighter than air. It is uh, extremely fluid. It's influenced by those external charges as one of the variables, but it also wants to take the path of least resistance because the flame is conductive and it, um, it wants to conduct, you know, close the circuit between my hand and plate as much as it can. The last demonstration, which is not one that can blow out or a power source die on, thankfully, um, is an atmospheric corona motor. Uh, some of you watching might have seen this. Maybe you haven't heard of it. Maybe you have. This is something I didn't hear about until about two years ago. Uh, very exotic form of motor because magnetic motors, as you know them, uh, they require high current. Even the smallest little battery powered motor conceptually uses a high current to create an electromagnetic field. Corona motors are completely different. They can run off extremely low currents at high voltages and inherently like a high static voltage, a high static charge that inherently is uh, symbolic of stored energy and the rotational movement of the rotor and the motor acts as the vector to transfer that charge. I'm gonna go back to the live feed here. My camera is consistently zooming in more and more. Bear with me one second. Ah, it's, uh, it's got a mind of its own, this, this uh, camera. It's a little bit better. <laughs> Let's take a look. Uh, this is the framing how it was supposed to be the whole time. The camera's doing its own, own thing. So uh, this is the corona motor you saw a picture of, which I'll talk about more in detail and show you. Uh, there are no wires present except for the wires connecting up these support beams. There are six support beams, and on each support beam, there is a fin, a sharp fin, which you'll see in detail with some pictures here shortly. Uh, there are no magnets involved, and this can run off extremely low currents but at high voltages. And this is important. Why, why is a corona motor different from other motors? Well, I've been doing this for 17 years. It is far more easy to generate a high voltage than it is to create a high current. And anybody in the modern world who's taken clothes out of a dryer right after they're done, you know exactly what I'm talking about. All that static clinginess of your clothes, 5, 10, 15,000 volts generated no problem. When you get out of your car to gas up your, your car too quickly and you rub against the seat, thousands of volts right there. It's easier to create a high static voltage than it is to create a high current. So you can actually use this in situations, um, which we'll talk about here shortly, which is really cool. Let me, doo -doo -doo. framing is killing me here. This is a, a small Wimshurst machine. It just creates about 10, 15,000 volts DC. It's safe to touch, just makes big gnarly sparks. It's really fun. It's a great power source for this. So fundamentally, this spins off of a, uh, I'll talk about it here shortly, positive and negative charges that are being transferred between the fins. Uh, there we go, taking a second to spin up. Longer than I would have liked, little motor. Um, the fastest I've gotten with this design is about 800 RPM. And Corona motors can be scaled up, built completely differently, but the fundamental principle of Corona motors, which you can, it's now blurring, on camera, I don't think you can see the individual movements, is that they operate off of that, that high static voltage. Here it is uh, a little bit closer up. No magnets, again, just using electrostatics. But the question at hand is, um, how exactly does that work? It's a pretty straightforward concept of two positive charges repel, two negative charges repel, but opposite charges are going to attract. Well. The Corona motor is brilliant, right? Using very, very low powers, it takes advantage of this and uh, acts as a charge transfer for those two, mm -mm, those two, two charges. Uh, so how does that spin? Uh, I wish I'd gotten a little bit closer on camera there, but so stage one, and keep in mind, you have an external power source on the Corona motor. So there's six fins, Six, uh, six fins, there's three, uh, two sets of three. Three of the fins are positively charged or ground, 
and the other three are negatively charged. So this is a permanent situation. The fin charge does not, the charges on the fin does not change whatsoever. Every other fin is positive negative. Well, let's start with one of the negatives. As I mentioned earlier, the geometric shape of the metal makes a big difference in terms of electric field strength. So these fins have sharp little edges. You can think of them as little razors. Uh, because of the sharp edge and the high voltage they're under, the, they ionize the air directly underneath of them. This sprays electrons onto the nearest foil strip. That's important. That foil strip retains that negative charge. But the strip to the right is positively charged. And that rotor is free to move. So that foil strip will rotate over towards the positive strip and you know, it'll be pulled and pushed uh, at the same time. Now there's a charge transfer that happens as soon as that negatively charged strip on the rotor goes underneath one of the positive fins. The positive fin, again, keep in mind, it's a, it's a permanent positive charge because you have an external power source connected to it. Uh, it will strip the extra electrons off of that foil strip. It'll actually continue stripping more electrons until that foil strip is positively charged. Well, now we have the opposite result of the last situation. Before it was negatively charged and repelling, uh, being repelled away from a fixed fin. And now it's positively charged being repelled away from a positive fin. It then goes and it gets pushed away towards the next fin, which is now negatively charged. The cycle repeats and it's completely cyc cyclical. It is really, really cool. And um, the, like I said, the foil strips act as charge carriers. So you can think of it as they allow a high state of energy to flow down to a lower state of energy, which is the natural state of the universe. That's how things work. And it's completely analogous to a water wheel. I was thinking about this while I was trying to, you know, make these slides. And uh, it's actually really, really analogous to a water wheel. The gravitational potential energy at the top uh, here is there's more gravitational potential energy in the water. And when the water goes down to the ground, there is less gravitational potential energy um, present in it. And what is the side effect? Well, you capitalize on that change in potential energy and you create rotational motion. The exact same thing happens with the Corona motor. You have uh, a high voltage that wants to go down to ground level, so to speak, and you take advantage of that energy differential and you create rotational motion out of it. But um, yeah, this is, this is a really interesting process of, of how you create motion from completely static charges and you can create usable torque out of it as well. So repulsion, attraction, swapping of charges, repulsion, attraction again to the opposite thing, and those, those foil strips do all the work, analogous to a water wheel. But um, I titled this an atmospheric corona motor, right? Well, I shot a video this summer about extracting energy out of the atmosphere. It's, uh, it's a real thing, atmospheric electricity. And if you have access to a balloon or a drone or uh, even a tall tower, that gets more complicated with a tall tower, you can extract thousands of volts directly out of thin air. So what you're seeing is a very grainy blown up picture uh, freeze frame of one of my videos. This is a, my drone and the little X on the bottom of the screen is an electrode. And a better view is directly from that drone <clears throat> looking down. That is uh, an electrode that's about 120 meters up in the sky and you know why is this important well the electrostatic uh, the uh, the energy you're able to extract out of the atmosphere is height based so the higher up you go the greater of a different uh, voltage differential you, you'll be able to pull out of the sky and so this electrode isn't just hanging underneath the drone it's also attached to a big spool of wire and so that wire, then once I get to the height, I break off the wire and I attach it. I think I have a picture here. Yes, uh, I attach it directly to the Corona motor. The one of the inputs uh, of the Corona motor goes directly to the sky, which is a net positive charge. And then guess where the other side is connected to? It connects to ground. So uh, there you have your two power inputs. And I, again, have the PowerPoint uh, skills of a seven-year-old, so I wasn't able to put a video in here, but using atmospheric power, very, very low current, at about 10,000 volts or so, um, I was able to get this corona motor to spin up. And so that's the advantage of a corona motor over a traditional motor, 
is you don't need a tremendous amount of current to get it spinning and get usable torque out of it. So ideally I could have gotten that. Um, AJ, you've got two minutes left. Thank you very much. Perfect, perfect. Um, ideally I would have gotten that fire bending a little bit more and not being temperamental and blowing out like crazy. Um, but uh, I, I encourage you to look into this and hopefully I've turned a, a couple of gears into what is actually possible with high voltage physics. Uh, hopefully you're curious and inquisitive. And if I've inspired at least one of you watching to, you know, take a dib, uh, take a, a, a deep dive into the plasma verse like me, then like, I'm, I'm really happy. So, um, but. Hey Jay, it's uh, it's Mike. I think we got our timing off. I think you actually have like uh, about five minutes left on your scheduled time. Sorry about that. Oh, hey, no worries. No worries. I'm actually closing up here. And as you guys can kind of see, you know, I uh, appreciate you guys watching. Thank you very much. I'm not going to attempt to say, I'll, okay, I'll try. Arigato gozaimasu, gracias, grazie, merci. However you say that in Russian and you good old chap. Um, appreciate all you guys listening to my talk. And I encourage all of you in your free time to just dig further and like see what is capable with high voltage physics. So thank you. Okay. I guess I'm gonna be over in the discord now for uh, questions and answers. Yeah, thank you very much, Jay. Well, jolly good, as we say. Um, we'll be back at the top of the hour with Supply Frames, Own, Boyer, and Tadek. Please join us then.
we're going to do some audio video tests while we're waiting. Uh, Boya, welcome to the channel. Do you want to unmute your microphone and camera so that we can see if they're working? Here I am. Can you see? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I saw you for a moment and then you went away again. Yeah. Now? Yep. Yep. There you go. Your camera good. looks good. Looking Very good. Very well. good. All right. Uh, do you have any questions or do you feel like you're all set? No, I'm just checking everything now. I had a very. I had the huge problems about the the timing here. I tried to to do it, and I, I, I'm still I'm still uh, the the deleting some uh, <laughs> slides. Well, the nice thing is, it looks like the audio and video are all working well. Um, so if yeah, you want good, to... good. That's good. Yeah, if you want to uh, mute your microphone and video again. Um, it looks like we're at about 12 minutes and we're going to get Dan in mm -hmm. to be the MC and, and test his microphone next. Okay, I'll mute my mic here. All right, we're going to do another AV test. Our next MC, Dan, is in the room. Dan, do you want to test out your mic and video to make sure they're working OK? Looks like your video is great. I don't know that I'm hearing audio, though. 
Nope. I see you talking. Nope, nothing. I'll let you know when I hear it. You might need to, I don't know, restart Zoom. <laughs> that sometimes works. Still not hearing you, Dan. How about if I switch microphones? Yep, I hear that. All right, let me see if I can go back to Blue Snowball. Nope, I do not hear that. Is it possible you have a, another program that's using that mic? Or if the mic level is set to nothing? All right. How about now? Yes, that's it. Okay. It was Discord. Aha. Uh -huh. All right. Um, so Discord uh, wanted it. Yeah. So it looks great. Uh, do you have any questions going into it? Uh, no, I don't think so. Am I, am I beautiful? You are. Just remember, you're going out live on the feed right now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hello. Hi, everyone. feed. Hi, everyone. <laughs> All right. Okay. So if you want to mute your uh, mic and video, we will uh, come back for the introductions in about five and a half minutes. Now, where's the spotlight control again? Is that under view options? Um, so I'll take care of that for you guys. Okay. Uh, but if you do right. need to use it, it um, I think you should just be able to right click people's uh, like preview square and choose it there. Okay. Great. Thanks. All right. See you in a bit.
Mike, may I ask you something? Yes, go for it, Boya. Uh, I see here the green message. You are viewing Mike Stish's screen. Is it okay? Or I'm on some other the wrong address? No, you're at the right place. It's the, the countdown timer is uh, being shared from my computer. So when we get to the when we get down to the countdown, we'll shut that off and we'll turn Dan on to introduce you. Is it okay that I see you are viewing Mike's dish screen? Yeah, yep, that, that's what it should. It's happen. okay. Thank yep. you. Thank yep. you. Welcome, Dan. Hi, welcome back. Uh, my name is Dan Maloney. I'm a staff writer here at Hackaday, and I'm here to take you through the last of today's talks. Um, we're going to get started right now um, with our next speaker, who has nearly a half century of hardware design experience under his belt. Has been around long enough to actually see something that he's designed um, be enshrined in the Computer History Museum, which is a, a big accomplishment. He comes with us today uh, to condense down his life's work and tell us um, how to become a hardware act, how to become a hardware expert in only 40 minutes. Please welcome Voya Antonich. Hi. Can you see me? Hi. Hey, I, I'm I'm Voyantanich, and uh, we will use these 
40 minutes to understand the, the basic of microprocessor architecture. I have to speak fast because I want to make some time to show you something. Uh, but uh, we will start from very basic logic circuits and uh, build the hypothetical microprocessor part by part. And uh, uh, that will not be actually the fully functional microprocessor because it's, it's, it's a little bit simplified. I'm not sure that it would work, but it will be good enough to just to, to show the basic principles of, of uh, uh, microprocessor ar architecture. Uh, but uh, before we start, it's important for you to know that uh, we, uh, you, you don't have to understand uh, all schem schematic diagrams in detail. Uh, don't try to follow every single logic level. It's enough for you just to, to understand the purpose of logic circuits and their input-output dependencies. Uh, there are also several uh, points where you must learn about certain circuits. So you must uh, pay the special attention and those slides will be notified by the blue background. Just let me see how to, to share the screen. Yeah, like this. I hope that now you see the shared screen. I, I guess so. Just a moment. Yep, yeah, looks good from here. Yeah, good, good. So this is the normal slide and this is the blue slide which should uh, uh, just uh, uh, notify that, that something important happens and that you have to pay special attention and uh, there is something uh, if there is something extremely important uh, the the screen will be red like this uh, uh, actually there is only one completely red screen and we will uh, uh, the, the, the only one but uh, you will be uh, surprised to see that it's also the most the, this is the simplest slide in the presentation. So it, it may be the, the, the simplest possible circuit that can be built. It will be the most important circuit. So let's talk about why digital electronics are so superior against the, the analog ones. Just a moment. Uh, I'm, I'm confused about this Zoom interface because I didn't use it too much. I have to, to uh, uh, do you see signal from camera now? I hope so. Um, not yet, boy. I don't, I don't see the other uh, camera. Just a moment, please. I'm sorry. Now you see it, good. Uh, I prepared some some short demo just to 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 uh, let me compare digital and analog electronics. This is the 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 uh, one of these screens, the left the left instrument that you see, uh, represent the analog signal. When I turn this button, then you can see that this instrument uh, the uh, voltage rises or drops, and you see the LED above the instrument which also follows that signal. The, the right one is digital signal. It can be only on and off. And why is it so important now? And why did we, uh, what's, what's the, the actual, why is it the, the, why do we use digital electronics instead of analog ones. What, what's so good about digital electronics? Uh, look at this uh, diagram. Uh, the, the, the price performance ratio for analog electronics is not so good for us. The price, when you, when you increase the accuracy of, of analog, uh, signal, then you see that that uh, 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 cost for analog circuit rises exponentially in, in exponentially uh, 
uh, with with uh, raising the accuracy of the signal. And when you uh, use the, the digital uh, the circuit, then with with every with every uh, single bit that you add to the circuit, you raise the price linearly or or approximately linearly. But but the the performance and the accuracy doubles with with every single uh, bit added. That's what that's what makes digital uh, circuits so so uh, familiar to us, because we can achieve any accuracy that we want, and uh, that's for for uh, the, the, without rising the cost significantly, and uh, that's the the the, the catch. Uh, but we are talking here about hardware, so we will switch to back to the, the hardware circuits. We will use this the, the, the similar screen in, in many examples here. Uh, in order to build a circuit, we must have a current supply first. Uh, the three volt battery will be good enough for that because most of digital circuits works well and it uh, three volts uh, voltage. Uh, minus, minus pole is usual, usually considered as the common ground and, the, the, and it's used as a reference point for all voltage measurements. Here it is marked as blue, you see it here. And the red color represents the full voltage, three voltage, or or it's it's logical signal one, and when we see the the output configuration of the typical uh, digital circuit, we see that we can switch the the lower switch on to to make zero signal, or to switch to or to switch on the the upper button to to generate one signal, and that's it. But uh, when both uh, switches are off, then the signal is in floating state. And uh, please note that it's not a zero state, it's floating states. It's undefined. And in most cases, it is uh, the, uh, not, not uh, allowed in, in digital circuits to, to, be, to, to have a floating state. Its state should be defined. The only exception is when we connect several outputs together, then all outputs should be floating except one, which should define the, the logic state of that line. But we are not using switches, but, uh, but transistors in our circuit. So we have two transistors instead of these two circuits. And when we connect those two transistors, we have uh, uh, the common input, here it is, for the circuit. When the lower transistor is uh, conductive, it's when the input is high, then the lower transistor is conductive, then the output is zero. And when the upper one is con uh, conductive, it's with when input is low, then output is high. So you see that output always uh, follows the inverse, inverse level of the input and that uh, uh circuit is uh, named uh, inverter or not circuit and we see it here look at this bubble at the output it means that the output is inverted this bubble always means inversion whether it is at the output or at input and this uh, overlined here symbol it means that that this output is inverted also and this is the truth table for the uh, inverter. When input is zero, output is one. When input is one, output is zero. Another circuit that we have to pay attention about is end circuit. Uh, you have two or more inputs. And when A and B and C and D, if there are more of them, if they are all ones, then our output will be one. That's why it's called end circuit. And the third one is OR circuit, which says when A or B or some, some, some others, if there are some, uh, when they are zero, then output will be zero. And that, that's why it's called OR circuit. So at this moment, we know about three uh, basic circuits. 
it's not circuit or inverter and circuit and or circuit and uh, uh, if you wonder how many more do we have to learn about there are no more it's all it's a whole digital electronics co uh, contains actually these three circuits and that uh, looks simple isn't it that Yes, but uh, only before we start to combine these three gates. Uh, for instance, like this. This is Intel's processor 8286, introduced in 1982, and it contains only 134,000 transistor. I said only because today's microprocessor contains several billion transistor on the chip, on the same chip size, and they all form just these. Uh, they are the all circuits are made just this of these three basic circuits they are very important so we should we should pay special attention of them uh the the the, the small uh bubble here you can see it here and here and so on uh means inversion i've said that and the, this uh you can represent end and not circuit at its output as the single circuit, then it's called an end circuit, not, not end or an end circuit. In the similar manner, you have no circuit here with inverse output. It's not or anymore, it's now not or or nor. Uh, there is only one more circuit. I said that there are several variants of, of the circuits of basic circuits. This one is a little unusual OR circuit. It's actually not the, the, it, it, not the basic circuit. It can be uh, built of other basic circuits, so it's not basic one. The only difference between OR and NOR is this situation when you have both input uh, inputs one, at OR circuits, output is one, one and uh, at, or, at XOR circuit, the output is zero. XOR means exclusive zero, and uh, it's shortened for, for just XOR. Uh, XOR circuit is also quite important in digital techniques, and we should pay good attention about it because it's frequently used. I said that it can be built uh, from other basic circuits, like here you see it built with four NAND circuits. You can build it in, in, in most, uh, uh, in, in, in some other ways, not only this, but I like this because it's symmetric and somehow beautiful. So let's see now how we can build uh, some complex circuits out of uh, simple circuits of basic circuits. First one is the most frequently used complex circuit. It, it's decoder. This decoder decodes three address line lines to, to eight uh, single lines at the output. You see, there are addresses A, B, and C here. And when you set them to some levels, say 0, 0, 0, then output 0 will be active. When they are, for instance, uh, 1, 0, 0, then Y1 is active. When you set to 0, 1, 0, it's 2, then Y2 is active, and so on. There is one more input here. It's gate impulse, uh, in input. Uh, when it's passive, then all outputs are passive. Then the, the, it actually enables the selected, out, the selected output. And uh, it enables uh, actually the whole decoder here. Here is the truth table for the decoder. Uh, you see all possible states. Here you see this XXX means any address. When enable this one, is one, which means passive because it's overlined, then all outputs are passive and it doesn't matter which states are on these three outputs. You can only also build the, the complex decoder. I've told about three to eight lines. It could be two to four lines or four addresses to 16 lines and so on. Uh, but if you need the, the bigger uh, decoder, you can build it out of simple decoders. You see now you have the, the, the this is the main one, which is supplied by high addresses, D, A, D E, and F. And it just addresses the, the eight 
the, the decoders, which are the same, but at the lower level, they are addressed by ABC addresses. So uh, you can, you also have one large six to 64 decoder made of, of nine uh, three to eight decoders. The enable signal, of course, has the same uh, function. And this is the same symbol for decoder, and it's also a very important one, so we will pay attention on it. Let's go on. We've said that, that uh, uh, there is three state output when the output is simply disconnected, like this. This is the, the electronic view of the same circuit. You have another more uh, input here, which enables or disables output. When this one is passive, then output is in high impedance here, Z, Z output. Z means, uh, uh, Z is a, uh, a symbol for impedance, so it's used uh, for, for high impedance state. Then it's disconnected simply. And you can use eight buffers here. You see these eight buffers, they are not, look like inverters, but they are not inverters because they don't have the bubble at the output. They are actually buffers which are do nothing circuits. They really do not. They just, just transfer the signal from input to output. But here only when this enable input is, is active. So only one of these outputs of this decoder is active. So only one of these inputs will be active and only one of these inputs say input four, if it is uh, zero, zero, one, then the input four will be selected, of course, when, when enable is activated. And we have uh, input four transferred to output. When enable is passive, then output is in high impedance state, it's deselected. And this is the symbol for the selector. Now, Let's see how uh, the, the, we will switch to arithmetics a little now. This is the simple adder. It adds two binary digits here, A and B. It could be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1. And this is the sum for that. If it is 0, 1, then sum is 1. But if it's 1, 1, then it cannot fit in, in the same. It, it should be 10 binary, but uh, a sum will be 0 and carry will be one. This is the situation for that overflow condition. And that's why we must have carry. Uh, that carry is used to be transferred to the next stage of, of, uh, of adding. If you have more stages, if we have to add more uh, binary digits. And uh, that's why we must have that carry input to accept that carry from the previous stage. And this carry out goes to carry input of the next stage. And we get the, the, the adder, which is which looks like this. This is four bit adder, but it can be any other number, eight bit, 16 bit adder, 64 bit adder or, or any of them. It always has the common carry in, which propagates, propagates, propagates bit by bit here and we have the carry out. This overflow is not uh, significant in this moment, just it, it's used for, for subtraction, not for addition. This is the, the adder, and uh, uh, you see that operand, one operand and another operand, when you uh, apply some logic levels to the, those input, you've got there some here. And if, if it does not fit in four bits, it generates the carry out. And that's all. And there are also some other outputs here, which are generated by, by a multi-bit uh, adder. Carry out, we've seen about it. Overflow is for subtraction only. Sign is a sign bit. If you know about uh, uh, binary numbering system, I I'm sorry, uh, I, I, we, we have to assume that you know about binary numbers, so we will not talk about them. All programmers are actually expert for that for that thing. Uh, so sign is is normally in two complements 
notation, sine is the state of the most significant bit. Zero is uh, set when all outputs are zero. So when you have zero, 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 then this zero is one. In all other cases, it's zero. And parity is actually the number of ones in the whole result. You just count how many ones do you have. And if you have the even number, then parity is set. If it's odd number, then parity is reset. Now you should imagine uh, some other circuits here. Here is the rightmost is adder, 4-bit adder. We've just talked about it. You can only put four end gates. You see all of these circuits has four, four uh, bit inputs and four bit outputs, if it's four bit processor, of course. And uh, uh, you should imagine this in, in four layers. That's why these bus lines are so thick, this one and the and output also. They also con they actually contain four single lines, see this. So you have four end gates, four OR gates, four XOR gates, complement, which is inverting every, every bit in the, in the four bit world. Negation is, is when you invert all bits and add one to the result. Oh, well, you, you, you know it uh, from the binary system. The, 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 the two's complement arithmetics is applied. Uh, increment number and decrement number by, by one. And we have eight uh, four bit outputs here and only one of them is selected here. Selected is negation, could be any other also. And the selector, the main selector is opcode. It has three bits, which actually address one of these outputs. And we have the result. This is the electronic version of the same circuit. And that circuit that can do any of these operations is called arithmetic logical unit. It's the very important circuit. It's in the heart of the microprocessor. That's why it's blue here and we should take good uh, care about it. Now let's talk about uh, uh, some other type of, of logic. Here we, 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 we were talking only on combina combinational logic. It's a, it's a logic which, had, which has only one direction of data flow. You see, you have some logic input here and you get the same logic input here in this circuit, which is very simple, of course. Uh, it's, it's just the, the circuit which does nothing because it inverts here this zero and creates zero again at the end. But what happens if we connect the, the output and input of this circuit? Think for a moment, if, this, if we have one here, then the, the, we will have zero here and one here. So this circuit is it it self supports itself. It it's a stable uh, state. But what if we have zero? Then we have one here and zero here. Then it's again stable. So it has two stable states, and it's so important. It, it's such such a big step in in digital processing that it's that uh, red circuit here the most important in digital electronic as it actually made computing possible. Uh, that's why it deserves this place of honor. Think about it, I'll keep for a few seconds. So it's a circuit which, which has two stable state and which enables whole computing today. We can uh, represent it in another way it's the same circuit actually, but, but uh, drawn so that it is symmetric. We'll need it later to simplify the diagram. And these are two possible states of this circuit. But the disadvantage is that we don't have no inputs here. So we can have two outputs and we can read. We can read actually one of two states. This is, uh, let's consider this one as the main output. He reads one. And here the state of the circuit is zero, but we don't have inputs. And we will uh, switch those inverters for, for uh, uh, NAND circuits. It's the same circuit and it behaves the same, but now it has reset and set impulse. Here is inputs, here is reset, and here is set input. And uh, 
when these inputs are high, then these circuits act as inverters and they do nothing. They just keep on state. But when you drive some of them low, look here in the diagram. When you uh, bring set input to low level, it's overlined, so low is active. Then the whole circuit is set. Q is high. And when you drive a, a reset low, then Q is low. And so we can set or reset the whole circuit. And we will follow only Q output. This one is always uh, 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 opposite of it. So we don't care about it anymore. And here we are at the, the first demo circuit here. This is the same circuit, but uh, just modified so that it's uh, good for demo. I'll switch back to camera for a moment and I'll show you uh, how does it work. You see here is the same circuit as you have seen on the schematic diagram and you can reset or set the circuit. You see now set, reset, set, reset. And when you don't touch any button, then uh, actually it just memorizes the, the, the it, it holds the 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 last uh, the, uh, the last value when I when I pressed one of these buttons. Now let's go on with the schematics. Uh, the, the it works well, but it's not what we want. We don't want the the negative level to to reset or or set the, the circuits. What we need is to, to load data level when we want. So this data should be zero or one, but when you press this load button, then it will be uh, transferred to this main output, to this LED. So when the data is high, then this circuit is transparent. It actually transfers data immediately to output without any other uh, uh, actually I'm sorry uh, when 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 uh, yeah when 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 it's high then it it's uh, it uh, transferred the, the, the it, 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 when it's high it, it keeps the output sorry but uh, when you press this load button it's transparent when it's low it's transparent uh, this flip-flop is the same one but without buttons it's with the logic level here when load input is high then the circuit is transparent and when uh, it's low then it memorizes the 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 last uh, value when it was transparent uh that's much better now we can we can fetch data here in this circuit with load, but it's still not what we need. Uh, the problem is that it becomes transparent here at the beginning of load of load input here, and uh, 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 we uh, and it flips its states uh, uh, at the same moment. We need something uh, uh, the, faster than this, which will which will do the same thing in zero time. Uh, you see, th this is the same circuit, but we do the, the slightly optimized with one gate more, and that's all. And now, now I will I will demonstrate this circuit also to you. Just a moment. So, here is the, the similar circuit. This switch here, this small switch here, is data input. It does not change when when I press this button, it changes. It's transparent, but uh, when I uh, the, don't press the, the the load button, this is load button here. When I don't press it, it memorizes. It does, does not change. But at the, at the time, at the moment of pressing, it it fetches the the button state. It's much better. That's what we need, really. But but. Uh, uh, like I said, it's it's uh, not the best possible thing because we need we need it to be uh, done in in uh, zero moment. We'll see why. You see, look at this circuit. 
uh, it's con uh, it, it contains actually two D flip flops. It's called master slave circuit because it has two flip flops. This one is master, the lower one. So uh, when the clock is high, then then the then this one is transparent, and when clock is low, then this one is transparent. What we get with this is that only at the 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 edge of clock signal. Look at this diagram here. No, look at this diagram here and here. All green points. Uh, it flips only at the falling edge of this clock signal, only at the edge. That means that it can, it can be written and read at the same moment, at the, at the same. It, it, it's so fast that it can actually uh, be. Uh, it, it, it can actually uh, fetch its own state, like this. We'll soon see that example, but uh, sorry, it's too fast. Uh, this uh, circuit is also very important, and we'll see that that it is very frequently used in microprocessors. Is your it's used to build the registers in microprocessors because they have to be that fast, and they have to be capable of. Uh, reading it and writing at the same moment without any error here's the example here of that circuit i will show you soon but just let's let's discuss one you see this circuit here described as the, the noted as the, the bouncer uh, i have the clock button here but uh, the problem is that when you when you press the clock button this signal in this point here goes something it does not goes go like this it goes maybe like this it has some dirty uh signal and then goes to low signal because uh the button has some bouncing when you press it and there in, instead of, of one clean signal you have several hundreds of, of, of very dirty signals this debouncer cleans that and it corrects that error. Uh, we don't have to talk much about it because it's it's actually not a part of the microprocessor. Is it just it's just used for demo here, and that's all. Now I will uh, show how this circuit looks like. Uh, this is also the data input. You see, and uh, this is the clock input and uh, when i connect the uh, uh, not q output which is inverse output to the input like this and i, I will just uh, just remove this white led which which displayed the the Y position we don't need it now. Now see how it works. At every uh, uh, press of the button, it just copies its inverse state, so it it just flips the state. And it's actually very useful circuit because we can use it to build. Just a moment. We can build uh, the. This is the same circuit with the connected uh, not Q output to data. We can use it to build some kind of frequency divider here. I've said uh, every uh, every falling edge of clock signal flips the state of output. So if we connect this output to the next stage, then it will uh, do the same thing, but with the lower fre frequency. And we get the binary counter, actually. This is four bit binary counter. The clock comes from the right side and it switches output first, second, and so on. And the logic diagrams for these outputs looks like they look like this. 
with every falling edge of the, the clock signal, we have the new uh, state of output. We had the, the output state, which is binary uh, incremented by one. One, two, three. You see, three is because uh, state out zero and out one are high. And out two and three are, are zero and so on. This works as a binary up counter and that's what what makes uh, digital counting possible. Uh, I will show you how that counter looks like. Look at here. This is the four bit binary counter. And when I press button, each time you have the new binary number increased by one. If you are familiar with binary arithmetics, you can see how it counts. But it can not only count, and it can also, it has another input which resets the whole circuit. When I press this reset button and press clock, then it resets to zero, 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 zero always. And another input, which is load input. I have four inputs here. You see this uh, dip switch here with four uh, switches. When I press this load button, they are now they are set to one zero one zero, and when I press it, it uh, it uh, uh, just loads this binary input, and uh, and uh, we can load it to any desired value. Now, let's go back. And see what else can we do with parallel with with the, that uh, uh, master study flip flops. We can use uh, most. Uh, we can use several of them to build a parallel register to 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 fetch the the whole word several bits at a time, and it's very frequently used in microprocessors as it's a kind of of uh, of parallel par parallel register. There are there are. Uh, a lot of registers in every microprocessor. Um, uh, and uh, actually the whole uh, data memory is a series of parallel registers. Now we are going, we, we are starting to build our processors and we have to do it fast. We'll see uh, a register is accumulator, which is the, the most important register in the computer. And here is arithmetic logical unit. And it can, at, at every clock cycle, it can at the same time read accumulator. And uh, for instance, if opcode is adjusted to, for adding, it can edit with operand B. And, and so, and, and the, the result will be written here. Then the next instruction could be incrementing that to the end or, or something like that. So it, it crunches number at series with, 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 uh, with every clock cycle. Uh, but one register is not enough. We added B register here also. We, we, we will need uh, more registers. I said there are a lot of registers in, in, the, in microprocessors. Some of them contain 30, 32 accumulators only. And, and a lot of other registers. Uh, we said that arithmetic logical unit uh, creates some, some flags, and they are also fetched in the special register, which is also parallel registers. And we will move it aside to make room for some other circuits. This is data memory, which can be read to read and write uh, data, and program memory, which, which can only read. From memory, microprocessor is not allowed to write something to, to the program memory, at least in, in most cases, the, the, you, you have some special special way to write something to program memory at most uh, modern microcontrollers. And uh, there is a bus here, bus line here, which is internal data bus, which connects all registers and, and also goes out. Here are some supposed pins to, to address external memory. And we must have the clock signal, which is the, the main uh, conductor of the system. 
we must go really fast now. Uh, this clock signal uh, feeds the, the two-bit counter, which counts to four, and uh, the decoder decodes those four steps. Those steps are equal, actually the main sequence of the microprocessor. At the first step, the first uh, uh, the clock signal, it reads the program memory here at the data out, it reads it somewhere. And uh, we, we will skip the, the next uh, the cycle here, the next phase. The, 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 this output, the next output is execute sequence. It just reads from memory if, if one of operands is from memory or it reads from the accumulator and so on. And the last output just triggers write result to memory or to accumulator or, or somewhere in some of, of these registers. We have also a parallel register which fetches the, the, the contents from the program memory because program memory had when, when it's read, then uh, th these outputs should be stable enough as program memory is slow memory and it has to prepare the next program word for the for the processor uh, i've told that the instruction decoder is the the second step uh, this is uh, one of possible variants how instruction decoder should be uh, connected the, the, there are many decoders actually in in uh, instruction decoder of the microprocessor. Uh, uh, the one part of the program word here, one part of the word, it's only three bits of eight bits here in total. It defines which instruction is uh, in program, which the, the, the instructions should be performed. See, if it's zero, 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 then the, it's arithmetic logical instruction. And in that case, it counts what uh, opcode is here. Is it addition, ending, oring, and so on? Here you see the the just oh, it's here. Here you see uh, the choice of, of ALU operations and so on. And uh, if it's some other instruction, then some some then these three bits are fed to 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 some other part of the of the computer, some executive part. Uh, the, date, the addresses are also are uh, mostly this is this is hypothetical eight bit processor actually, and these addresses are uh, sixteen bit. It's not enough to have eight bit addresses, and here in in program memory they are also sixteen bit addresses. So so. Uh, uh, we can address it directly from the program memory when we say write this data to, to say address 0007 uh, uh, and it's, then it's direct addressing. But there is also indirect addressing addresses when, when the instruction says write this data to memory addressed by accumulator and B register, for instance, or so on. It's indirect address addressing. That's why we have selector here, here, sorry, uh, because uh, one of these bits addressing mode here can be direct and indirect. And uh, just a moment. Yeah, good. And th there are some, some uh, from the instruction decoders, there are some other signals which which just set some some other uh, parts of the micro which which enables some part of the microprocessor depending on the on the instruction in the in the program word. Uh, we'll not waste much time about it because we don't have much time. Um, uh, there is program counter here. It's a very important part also. Just let me find my, yeah, here is my cursor, it's very small so I can see it. Uh, a 16-bit program counter, which uh, defines which program word will be uh, read from the program memory. For the beginning, this reset signal just resets the program counter to 0000, zero, zero, zero so that it starts operation from, from uh, program word 0. And it can be also loaded by some other value and so on 
or incremented. Uh, I said uh, that uh, in uh, uh, direct mode, uh, uh, the program has to, to define the address in direct mode. It's here and here. Has to define 16 bit address, but by eight bits. It, it, it cannot be obtained without uh, loading uh, registers in several steps. So it reads not only one byte command byte from the, from the program memory, but also uh, two more bytes which define the address for uh, uh, data memory or for program memory. And at last, there is one bit selector here. Uh, which uh, selects the carry flag, which should be uh, output here to load the program counter if the instruction is jump. Jump instruction is uh, just has uh, not only to, to increment the program counter every time after the instruction, but to load it, to load it with some new value, which is also defined by your parallel registers here. Two minute warning, boy. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll be finished soon. And uh, uh, the, the, these two registers are uh, used to define the 16-bit the program counter address for, for 16-bit jump. And now uh, it's, it's the whole story about the, the microprocessor. Uh, this is... Uh, just the structure of, if you see the structure of uh, uh, the machine program, you will see that it contains only arithmetic logic instruction, data copy instruction, and conditional branch instructions. And that's all. Unconditional jump is just a special case for condition, uh, a conditional branch. Uh, combining those three types of, of uh, uh, the, the, the types, these types of instructions, you can create uh, any, uh, any possible logic flow. You see, just like we, we uh, created the microprocessor by, by using only three basic logic gates, we can use those three, uh, these three uh, types of instructions to build, to build uh, some higher level, higher level program and and so on. And all we learned about the microprocessor is actually here, this little house. And what we have on the market now is a very complex house, but it's still a house. It's still a house that, that works on the same principles as, as this one. And uh, that's it. I just wanted to show you. I, my idea was to talk a little bit about the badge for, the, for which was made for the last year's conference, but unfortunately, you know why it was canceled because of the virus. And I want to tell you that this is a that hypo hypothetical processor, which is simulator, simulated by by 16-bit processor here, which can be programmed, which can be uh, single step, which can be slowed down so that you can see how the, the arithmetic logic unit works, how accumulator works, flags, program counter, and, and, and the part of, of, of data memory here on this display. Uh, I hope that we will soon have the, the not online conference, but the real conference, just like we had uh, before, and that this badge will be active then. Thank you very much for this and for your attention. Bye. Thank you, Voya. That was great. Um, if you're yeah. going to go over into the Discord, there are um, a lot of questions and compliments about your um, your Game of Life display. Oh, thank you. Decor in, your decor in general is uh, was well received. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move right along here. Um, our next speaker um, currently runs a startup that makes uh, PCBs hey, using. Dan, can, we, oh. can we take just a minute to do an AV check, um, and we'll be back oh. in about uh, four or five minutes. Oh, sorry.
All right. If you want to test out your mic and camera so that we know it's all working. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I think I see myself on the screen, so the camera looks fine. And if you can hear me, then I think I'm good to go. Yep, I think all of that sounds fine. Uh, and we're looking at, I'm actually going to move the timer here. Let's do about uh, 90 seconds work for you. Sorry, before I start? Sure. Yeah, great. All right, we'll be back in just a minute. Okay, now we'll get started again. Uh, welcome back to RemoteCon. Uh, our next speaker, uh, he currently runs a startup that makes uh, PCBs using physics-driven generative design. Uh, before that, he worked in the avionics group at SpaceX, uh, specializing in the effects of ionizing radiation on electronics design. So he knows how hard it is to design space-rated electronics and how the physics of space flight will do its best to kill your circuits. Please welcome Sergey Nestorenko. All right, thank you so much for that intro, Dan. Let me get my screen share set up here. All right, um, thanks everyone for joining the talk. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about a few of the many things that can kill you when you go to space, uh, as Dan alluded to earlier. There are many, many things that can. I'll only cover a few, and I'll only cover them very, very briefly. Um, so this is just meant as a quick introduction and kind of a bit of fun uh, and not really a, a full treatise on the subject. Um, so as Dan mentioned, uh, my background. Um, so before, uh, kind of in the last five years, I spent uh, at the Avionics Group at SpaceX. Specifically, I started out in the electromagnetic interference team. Uh, and then switched over to the ionizing radiation team, basically finding different ways to break electronics. Um, I wanted to show this kind of uh, picture here because it's the first flight of Falcon Heavy, which was also the first time we dipped uh, the second stage of Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy into the Van Allen belts. We spent quite a few years, not just myself, of course, large team preparing for this, and that was a big milestone for us. Um, separately, I currently run uh, a startup that uses um, uh, that's trying to make a physics aware PCB compiler. Um, we're hiring. If anybody's interested in talking to me about that, please find me afterwards. But for now, let's get going and talk about space. Um, so a quick disclaimer, space is hard. Uh, and as the first chart shows here, it really is true that how much you learn about it in high school or even starting a real job at NASA or SpaceX is limited. And when you start playing Kerbal Space Program, you learn even more. And that's about how seriously you should take everything I say. Um, you know, with every, every one of these topics, there are uh, teams of researchers at universities and uh, companies uh, studying these in detail for decades. And I couldn't even come close to touching that depth of expertise. So uh, if any of this information is actually relevant to you, go further and do some more research. And uh, another plug, Kerbal Space Program is awesome. If you like space stuff, check it out. So here's a few of the topics that we'll cover. Uh, everything from environmental effects like lightning and humidity uh, to things like radiation and heat, uh, reentry plasma, tin whiskers. Um, so without further ado, let's dive into these. So the first um, effect that I'd like to talk about is the effect of lightning. Um, I've kind of basically put all of these in chronological order of 
the life of a spacecraft. And uh, one of the first dangers that shows up when you put your spacecraft, your uh, rocket and your satellite on the pad is lightning. Um, so lightning is pretty common, unfortunately. We have to really think about it and deal with it. Um, there's basically two ways that can impact your spacecraft. Um, in the first image here, what we have is an uh, image of Falcon 9 standing at slip 40. Uh, where we actually have, thankfully, lightning towers. So these lightning towers are basically meant to be conductors that are bigger than the rocket itself. So if lightning were to strike, it doesn't strike the vehicle directly, but rather strikes the towers. But that doesn't eliminate all of the problems. Um, as you might imagine, there's quite a bit of current going through that lightning bolt, uh, which creates a very large magnetic field, which can then induce a whole bunch of other currents in your vehicle itself. Um, so despite it not being a direct attachment, you still have to think quite a bit about how your, um, you know, the current will show up in your long connectors that connect to your ground support equipment and what that will do for the rest of your electronics. Um, the second image here is even crazier. It is a direct strike uh, of lightning onto a Soyuz launch um, that occurred, uh, which is also not horribly uncommon. Um, so this, uh, happy to say that both of these launches survived and went on to do their missions and deploy their payloads without a problem, uh, which is a testament to many engineers who made that possible. Um, another fun story here is from Apollo 12, which was struck by lightning on ascent twice, no less, um, and set off all sorts of alarms on their ascent. Uh, but thankfully they did not pull an abort switch and realize that they could switch their uh, signal conditioning equipment and restore all the uh, alarms and keep flying. Um, so, as I kind of mentioned, unfortunately, some of the places we like to launch from are uh, places where a lot of lightning happens. Uh, Cape Canaveral and SpaceX Starbase are in some of the highest lightning dense regions in the country. Uh, Vandenberg is not, but Vandenberg unfortunately does not do a lot of launches compared to Cape Canaveral. Um, and the reason for this is uh, that we want to be as far south as we can uh, to launch. And we also want to launch eastward in most cases, because that's the rotation of, uh, that's the direction in which Earth rotates. And we get a little bit of boost from that. Um, that makes it a little bit easier to get to orbit. So um, this is kind of a, a conflict of interest, but that's why we have to deal with it. And we can't just put the launch pad somewhere where lightning is less of a problem. Um, so on the right here, we see kind of the shape, the electrical shape of a, of a lightning strike. Um, so the peak amplitude of a lightning strike can be as high as 200 kiloamps, uh, which is a lot. Uh, and at a pretty fast rise time on the order of hundreds of microseconds. Um, so obviously that is, uh, if you actually have to deal with a direct attachment, that is an insane amount of current to put up with. Uh, but even if it's not a direct attachment, the fields around uh, a lightning bolt can also be pretty crazy. So what we do in the aerospace industry to prepare for this is a whole bunch of mil uh, a whole bunch of standardized testing. Um, there's a whole bunch of tests called the mill standard tests that prepare for all sorts of things, not just lightning. Uh, but on the bottom left here, we have an example of the uh, lightning uh, test. And what it basically comes down to is you have your uh, unit under test on the left uh, and uh, some sensing and a power supply, and you take a transformer and inject a large current, uh, a large magnetic field around the conductor, one of the longer conductors you would have uh, on your equipment. And then you cross your fingers, hope it works. And if it breaks, you got to go fix it and make your design better. Another interesting source of things that can break your spacecraft are cruise ships. This is something I did not realize when I had set out. So more generally, um, around launch pads, there are a lot of radios. Um, there can be you know, radar, there can be uh, communication systems. Um, you know, they can communicate the systems, of course, on the actual rocket uh, and on your own spacecraft, and all of those things have to work together. So um, when you design a spacecraft to launch on a rocket, you have to make sure both that you are not emitting too much radiation from your radio so as to hurt the, the rocket itself, and vice versa, the rocket, uh, the, the electromagnetic radiation that the rocket emits won't hurt your spacecraft. So if you pull up the user manual of any launch provider, be it SpaceX, United Launch Alliance, ESA, so on and so forth, uh, you will see these envelopes that you have to test your spacecraft to and that uh, ensure that those two systems are compatible. Uh, but when you look at how these uh, profiles are derived, you can find all the different sources of radio and radar uh, that come up around the launch pad. And Cape Canaveral happens to be very close to a whole bunch of cruise ships, uh, which have a whole bunch of emitters. And so you have to design your spacecraft to withstand cruise ships. So this is a demonstration of 
roughly how that kind of testing goes to make sure that uh, either your individual units or entire spacecraft uh, meet these criteria. Um, so we uh, build these large anechoic chambers. Um, the word anechoic just means that they eliminate echo as much as possible. So all of those little triangular um, things on the walls are meant to dissipate electromagnetic waves as the electromagnetic waves hit them, basically simulating a free open space with no reflections because you would want to avoid any standing waves uh, messing with your test. So whether you're testing an individual unit or an entire spacecraft, you would roll it into one of these anechoic chambers. And specifically for this kind of testing, you would either have it operate and emit whatever radiation it does and pick that up with an antenna, or vice versa, blast some amount of radio energy from an antenna into your unit. And again, verify that it works and meets the envelopes. Another interesting source that I never thought about um, while uh, until getting my first job there is just the amount of animals that we have at, space, uh, at uh, Cape Canaveral. Um, so Cape Canaveral is actually on a wildlife refuge. So there's all sorts of turtles, birds, bats, uh, so on and so forth that live all throughout that, that region. Um, actually, even just when you drive from the entrance to Cape Canaveral to one of the pads, you'll frequently see turtles crossing the road and I've had to stop and move them off the road to, to make sure that nobody hits them. Uh, this is a common thing. Um, so it's actually happened that uh, a previous space shuttle launch has hit a bird, I believe it was a vulture on ascent. Um, so uh, after that um, happened, NASA had to come up with an entire bird abatement plan, which led to all sorts of programs from road roadkill cleanup to wildlife crossing signs, catch and release programs, sounds, uh, cameras tracking uh, birds, uh, radar, and so on and so forth. On the right here, we also have a very courageous bat that decided it wanted to go to space. So it clung on to uh, the fuel tank there of the space shuttle and rode at least a part of the way up. An ambitious bat, I would say. Another problem that we have to deal with is humidity and corrosion. Um, so because we want to launch over oceans where you know, there is no population and no risk of hurting anyone should the launch, launch go wrong. Uh, we have to deal with all the salt and the mist that comes from, uh, from that atmosphere. Um, so in particular, you know, at Cape Canaveral, you can kind of see from almost any launch pad just how close you are to, to the ocean. Uh, and something that I always underestimate is just how much of an effect that can have. Um, so, you know, for something like steel, you could be losing a millimeter per year uh, of steel mass into uh, to basically salt corrosion, uh, which of course weakens the structure of spacecraft you're trying to launch, or you know, for electronics to do all sorts of other uh, horrible things. Uh, and so we have to design special coatings to deal with this. Uh, and of course, these special coatings have to be tested uh, to make sure that they can withstand. Furthermore, in the case of uh, Crew Dragon here on the bottom left, um, it's actually designed to be reusable even after taking a swim. Uh, so not only do you have to deal with corrosion from kind of mist and, and salt in the air, but what happens when it actually uh, spends time in, uh, in the ocean after, before being pulled out. So as the vehicle takes off, um, there's quite a bit of shock and vibration that occurs. Um, so shock events are typically something that happens uh, at key points. So for example, when uh, the clamps release uh, the rocket for it to first take off, or when two stages separate, um, those are events where there's kind of a large jolt uh, that happens. Uh, but even outside of that, as you just take off, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, astronauts ride a, a rocket, uh, you can kind of see them shaking as they go up. And this is again, something we have to prepare for. Um, so we do testing um, both at the unit level and at the system level to prepare for these environments. Um, so on the bottom left here, we have an example by Moog uh, of a shock test uh, where they, I believe they take a pneumatic uh, actuator and basically punch uh, a unit to, uh, to deliver the shock that you might expect uh, in a very controlled manner, of course. And in the middle, we have the, James, the entire James Webb telescope basically put on a shaker table. And these environments are defined in terms of the amount of acceleration they get versus the frequency at which that acceleration occurs. And so these shaker tables will sweep through those frequencies and to those amplitudes and make sure um, that the spacecraft still holds together without any major issues. 
Another interesting thing um, that is perhaps a little bit less known, uh, less obvious than the previous ones is triboelectric charging. So triboelectric charging occurs when uh, two different materials that have a slightly different affinity for electrons um, come into contact and then come apart. Um, so we experience this every day as static electricity. Uh, for the most part, when you walk over a carpet or something and then uh, you know, get shocked when you touch a door handle, um, you've had triboelectric charging happen, charge you up to some large amount, uh, something like 30 kilovolts, and then when you touch a grounded uh, door handle, you, know, you dissipate that and it hurts. Um, so the same thing happens uh, during launch. Um, as a rocket flies through you know, the air, the atmosphere, um, uh, the cloud layers, uh, the same kind of charging can happen on the spacecraft. Um, and so um, manufacturers of rockets will actually put constraints on their launches uh, to avoid this issue and prevent it from uh, you know, charging up the vehicle, causing potential arcs, or just interfering with communication. Um, so for example, the Ares 1X rocket um, had to delay some of its launches due to uh, cloud layers that could lead to triboelectric charging. Uh, same thing with Rocket Lab. Um, and on the right here, uh, we have a plot that actually shows how this charging can happen. Um, so this was a study uh, done uh, with a sounding rocket that uh, you know, went up to, I think, about 30 kilometers in altitude. And as it went up, they measured the electric potential being built up on the skin. Uh, and you can see it starting off close to zero and rising up to 30 or 40 kilovolts as it's kind of going up through the atmosphere and, of course, also returning. Um, so once we actually get to orbit, uh, we have to think a lot about heat. Um, and the interesting thing is that this goes in both directions. Uh, in certain cases, we have not enough heat. In certain cases, we have far too much. Um, so in the first case, uh, the Mars rovers, when sent to Mars, um, had to deal with extremely cold temperatures. The Martian atmosphere can get down very, very, very cold. And so all of those electronics were put into what's called the warm electronics box. That's the picture you see on the right, um, the technicians getting that launch prepared. Uh, simply because a lot of electronics and especially batteries do not perform well below a certain temperature, they actually had to provide heaters to keep them warm enough to perform. But conversely, the opposite problem can also happen. Um, so at the space station, because there is no atmosphere, there's no convective cooling, um, which is a kind of a strong mechanism that we have the benefit here from on Earth uh, to cool hot electronics. Um, something like a heat sink on Earth here would have a fan to blow air over it, and that fan would kind of touch the heat sink and with that convection take the heat away. That's not an option. Uh, and so at the space station, they have deployed these very large radiators because electromagnetic radiation is the only way to dissipate heat. So uh, electronics will be taken and put onto these uh, cold plate units um, where essentially fluid will run through and will heat up and be taken to the radiators, and the radiators will use electromagnetic radiation to dissipate that heat. Uh, another uh, repercussion of these extreme uh, temperature differences, it also comes up in the structural design of uh, spacecraft. So again, back in the Apollo days, um, they predicted that uh, when traveling towards the moon, uh, the spacecraft would heat up to over 100 degrees C on one side and go below minus 100 degrees C on the other side, which uh, for something as brittle as the heat shield could cause cracking uh, and could break it. And so they spent a lot of time thinking about either redesigning the heat shield to extend that temperature difference or to just provide heaters to make uh, the, heat, uh, the, of this, the heat on top of the heat shield kind of even during the coast to the moon. Uh, but the solution turned out to be a lot simpler than that, and it's called a barbecue roll. Essentially, uh, what spacecraft will do when they coast in orbit, so essentially when they're not very active, uh, is turn and spin on their axis. Uh, and that basically just evenly applies heat to all sides of the spacecraft and keeps it pretty even. Um, so on the bottom left here, you see Starman from uh, the first Falcon Heavy launch. And the reason you see that Earth rotating there is precisely this. Um, the spacecraft was performing a barbecue roll uh, for this exact reason. And speaking of uh, other problems with light and radiation, uh, we have a lot of issues with cameras. Uh, cameras can be quite unhappy. Uh, so an example of electromagnetic radiation causing havoc on a camera actually also occurred on Apollo 12. 
um, which was, I believe, the first launch to bring a color camera to the moon. And unfortunately, uh, one of the astronauts that was on the surface, Alan Bean, uh, as he was setting it up, uh, pointed the camera at the sun and burnt out the camera tubes. Uh, and failed to get good footage for us there from that first launch, from that, uh, from that launch. Um, I think hopefully nobody else is using camera tubes anymore. So hopefully that's not a problem, but it has happened. Uh, and a different form of radiation uh, called ionizing radiation, in particular, particulate radiation, uh, also still causes problems to this day. So we have a picture here of uh, Chris Hadfield on a space station. And you'll notice if you watch almost any footage from a space station, quite a lot of burnt out pixels. Um, so those are pixels that were hit with charged particles, which I'll talk about a little bit in a second, uh, and cause damage, burnt out, and cause those artifacts. And speaking of radiation, this is a topic that uh, I enjoy seeing quite a bit on uh, forums, uh, Reddit, the internet, a lot of people are talking about it. Uh, and it's great to see people super interested, uh, but it's, I find that there's quite a few misconceptions simply because we don't deal with it every day. Uh, but one misconception I'll clear up here is, I assure you, Spaceman 98, we did not forget about radiation. So radiation of the ionizing kind, so we're talking about particles now rather than electromagnetic waves, really depends on where you go. Uh, and in general, in space, there are three major sources that we think about for missions. Um, so the first source is called the Van Allen Belt. Um, and in a nutshell, what's happening is that uh, Earth uh, has a molten core which creates a magnetic field around it. And that magnetic field acts as a trap uh, because charged particles, when they uh, enter that magnetic field, will tend to get trapped in it. They will kind of gyrate and spin and go up and down uh, and kind of stay in the same vicinity. And so we have these gigantic uh, belts full of protons and electrons jumping all around uh, at different points, but they're definitely not uniform. Um, they have a shape, and depending on your mission design, you may or may not run into them. Um, so for example, um, on the bottom right, we have the trajectory of, again, the Apollo missions uh, doing their uh, translunar uh, transfer from uh, low Earth orbit over to uh, lunar orbit. And you can see that because of their inclination, they actually get past the worst parts of the belts. Um, so if you look here, kind of right above the equator in this dense region is where you would get most particulate radiation. And they tend to kind of skirt around it a little bit, uh, minimizing a little bit of that problem. Uh, now, they didn't do that with that in mind by any means, but it, it is a lucky circumstance that you have to go down the middle of it. Uh, on the bottom left, we have a picture of uh, the contour of radiation at the altitude of the space station. Um, so even when you're at the space station, you're actually only inside the Van Allen belts for a relatively short amount of time uh, in this region that we call the South Atlantic Anomaly, because the SAA or South Atlantic Anomaly uh, occurs over roughly South America. And so uh, around uh, every day, there are a few orbits that the space station passes through this region. And for about five minutes, we'll have uh, quite a few more protons flying through the space station before tailing off and going back to kind of a, a relatively calm background level. Uh, by the way, the reason that this occurs in such an asymmetric way is that the magnetic field of the Earth does not actually quite go through the center of it. It's a little bit offset. And so that brings the belts a little bit closer on one side of the Earth rather than the other. Uh, the second major source is galactic cosmic rays. Um, so these are particles that are generated uh, either in our sun or in other suns in our solar system, uh, or sorry, in, a, in our galaxy, or completely in other galaxies and travel to us from, from quite far away. Uh, so these tend to be uh, even more energetic and cause an even larger problem, but thankfully there are fewer of them. Uh, and the extent to which they are a problem strongly depends again on the Earth's magnetic field. Um, the Earth's magnetic field gives us quite a bit of protection uh, if you're at a low altitude and close to the equator. But if you travel outside of the atmosphere and at the North Pole, it's as if it wasn't there. Uh, you might as well be in interplanetary space. Uh, and so different missions will have to consider, uh, depending on where they go, how much they have to deal with this. Um, an interesting uh, note about uh, the galactic cosmic rays is that we also get protection from them from the sun, uh, because our sun also has a magnetic field. And ironically, uh, when the sun is more um, active, uh, we'll tend to actually get less galactic cosmic rays because it's putting a negative pressure uh, and kind of shielding us from them a little bit more. But when it's less active, a solar minimum, that's when galactic cosmic rays become more of a problem. 
And the last source, as we were talking about the sun, is solar flares. Um, so the sun likes to throw us curveballs now and again in the form of more charged particles we have to deal with. Uh, and this tends to happen on an 11-year solar cycle. Um, nobody really understands why. Um, I'm sure people study it, but I have not seen a, a solid answer, and I think it's still being researched. Uh, but about every 11 years, the sun gets more and less active, and more and more of these flares happen, or less and less. And uh, these flares, when they do occur, they will first emit a lot of uh, X-ray radiation, so that's electromagnetic radiation with very high frequency, that will reach Earth relatively quickly, give us a heads up, before following through with a much larger uh, coronal mass ejection, they're called. Uh, and that's the actual protons and heavier elements that uh, eventually hit us and our spacecraft. So on the top right here, you actually see a prediction of uh, how that plasma or all those protons and heavier elements uh, traveled from the sun to Earth at a relatively recent flare we had at the beginning of this month. So one interesting misconception about radiation is that a lot of people propose shielding as a good solution to it. Um, and unfortunately, shielding is not that great at blocking radiation. Um, it certainly can work, but it's very, very heavy. Um, so for example, a uh, for something like a 400 mega electron volt proton, which we do have some of those in the Van Allen belts, not many, but some, uh, you would need as much as 40 centimeters of solid aluminum to stop that proton. Uh, and so that's obviously very heavy and in space flight mass is enemy number one. And so you want to avoid that as much as possible. Um, however, it is used sometimes. So uh, the Juno spacecraft that went to Jupiter uh, did actually use a half inch of solid titanium to protect its electronics because the Jovian belts are even more intense than anything we have to deal with. So why does radiation do anything to electronics? So as the name suggests, ionizing radiation means that as a particle travels through a crystal, so like a, um, you know, a PN junction uh, uh, of a part, uh, it can ion ionize the uh, atoms in that crystal. So turn them into atoms, strip their electrons away, make a charge, and then that charge will separate uh, and some of it will go into uh, you know, different regions, basically. And that can cause uh, a large temporary current, which can either flip a bit or it can actually damage your device. Um, so on the bottom left, we have uh, pictures of structural damage due to these uh, charge currents that happen. They heat up the elements so much that uh, you actually get you know, a little bit of molten metal and uh, fracturing, uh, and that can permanently destroy the device. Um, so the other way that damage occurs due to radiation is kind of less sudden. Uh, with the previous examples that I showed, uh, as soon as a particle hits a device, uh, you have a catastrophic failure uh, or even just a, a bit flip that you can kind of reboot away from. Uh, but there's another effect called total ionizing dose where over time, the radiation will uh, slowly degrade a crystal. And this can affect uh, regular electronics. So for example, on the right, we have a voltage reference that as it was exposed to more and more radiation uh, started to drift away from its true value. Uh, and this is not uncommon. Uh, but it can also cause damage to um, other materials. So for example, uh, glass uh, shown here on the bottom left uh, can degrade and uh, become less transparent. Uh, so this is a problem for solar arrays uh, or fiber optic communications and materials like that. So what you're seeing here on the bottom left is darkening of the glass uh, kind of towards the center where it's been exposed to more and more radiation. Um, another solution to this problem is to use radiation hardened parts, which are more or less practically immune um, to these kinds of strikes. Um, but the major problem with that is that just that they're expensive. Um, so, for example, the RAD750 has been used on quite a few NASA missions, uh, you know, for the rovers and uh, other spacecraft. And you are getting 200 megahertz of performance for $200,000 per processor. This was priced in 2002. I don't know what these are now, but that gives you an idea. Um, so that's actually not necessarily a great way to go unless you're only making one of that spacecraft and it's extremely valuable. Uh, the way we actually try to deal with these things uh, whenever possible is to screen parts by taking them to uh, facilities where we can recreate this kind of radiation on Earth, uh, eliminating ones that we know are going to be bad, uh, and then building in a whole bunch of circuitry to try to um, uh, mitigate the effects. Uh, so these could be current limiters, these could be watchdog circuits that reboot certain parts, 
Uh, this could be redundancy, and some combination of all of those things uh, can be sufficient to accomplish the mission with, uh, with high certainty. Uh, another problem that you get from the Van Allen belts is charging from electrons. So just like we have proton particles bombarding the spacecraft, we also have electron particles bombarding the spacecraft. And although they will ne not necessarily uh, have the same effect, um, they can still cause destructive failures. So electrons can accumulate at the surface of your spacecraft or penetrate deeper into the bulk of it. And again, cause charging, kind of like travel electric charging, but slightly different mechanism. And if that uh, potential builds up to too high uh, of a level, uh, you could get a discharge or an arc. And so what you're seeing here is uh, on the right is an example of a discharge that happened, I believe on orbit with the Eureka satellite that damaged the solar cell. Uh, because the body of the spacecraft presumably got charged up too far uh, and then discharged into the solar ray and burnt a solar ray out. And lastly, uh, or second to last effect is uh, tin whiskers. Um, this is an effect where a bulk uh, metal will spontaneously grow whiskers uh, without an electric field or without any other presumed uh, reason. Um, it is believed that this is caused by mechanical stress in crystals, uh, but it's still not a fully well understood effect. So people are researching it. Uh, but over time, as these whiskers can grow, um, that can cause a short circuit on orbit, uh, which of course could be destructive. And lastly, um, on the way back, a spacecraft will have to deal with reentry plasma. Um, so reentry plasma occurs when the spacecraft hits the atmosphere basically so hard that it turns it into plasma. Uh, and that plasma becomes kind of like a Faraday cage around the spacecraft, uh, preventing radio communications from getting through. Um, so in the shuttle, for example, or almost any other spacecraft coming back, there will be a communications blackout period where there's no way to get any data from the spacecraft or communicate with the crew in any way. Um, and uh, it's, it's a very interesting phenomena. Uh, and it may be possible to use higher frequency radios to communicate past it. Um, or people have also suggested like dumping materials into the plasma as the spacecraft comes down um, to try to mitigate it. Um, but so far I haven't seen anything uh, that has actually tried to get past this. For the most part, spacecraft just deal with this problem by anticipating there will be communication at that point. And uh, just as the last moment here, I have a few other resources for anybody who likes space stuff. Um, there's a lot of fun stuff here by a lot of great creators on YouTube and um, in other places. Uh, and so I recommend checking these out if you found this interesting. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. Well, it's perfect timing. We're right on schedule. Good job. Um, yeah, I, you kind of surprised me with the cruise ships thing. I, I, I didn't know that. I thought you were speaking metaphorically, but uh, then I realized, yeah, okay, uh, radar sets must really blast it out. I was, uh, yeah. That was some interesting stuff. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. We, uh, thank you very much for your, uh, for your talk. Appreciate it. Um, we're going to take about a five-minute break and do an AV check, and then we'll be back with Sprite TM. Come on back. All right, Sprite, it looks like your uh, mic is working. Do you want to test that? I'm not hearing you right now. I see you speaking. One of the things that Dan had problems with is that Discord was occupying his mic and he couldn't get it to work. I'm not sure if that's a similar issue. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, that's nice, but this is the wrong microphone. <laughs> um, at, at least the infrastructure works. Okay, I'll switch back to my proper microphone and I'll mess around with the audio levels a bit, see if I can make it work. Great.
I think we're getting nothing. I, if you haven't killed Discord already, you might want to try that because that is what happened with Dan at the beginning of his MC run. Can you hear yep. me now? Yes, I can hear you. Ah, yeah. So it works, but the volume level was just very low for some reason. Is the is the volume? Good, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, this is uh, this is the microphone uh, they actually uh, wanted me to buy to do the amp hour uh, thing. So I assume this... they know what they're talking about with regards to oh, microphones. Yeah. And just so you know, I should have said this already. This uh, the people on the live stream can hear us. Just so you know. Oh, they can. Okay. Yes. Um. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Uh, let's see, is there anything else you want to test out? Uh, I obviously got to share my video. Give me a second. I want to... Um, can you guys already see if my video, uh, like my webcam, is actually doing something? Is that visible for you? Not yet. I can't see myself here, so at least I don't think I can. Let me just stop the stop the countdown timer for a sec because that might be easier. Yeah, sure. Um, ah, there we go. Ah, and that's the wrong video camera. You can now see my neck, which is not the thing. Yeah, that's better. Uh, okay, that was exactly what I was afraid of. Oh yeah, that looks way better. Uh, you go be full screen. Okay, yeah. As far as I can see, video also looks good. Um, I'm not sure what China bandwidth does with it on your end, but looks great from here. Oh, excellent. That's the advantage of being in the morning. No one is awake yet to do stupid stuff like downloads. <laughs> all right, did you uh, all good? Yeah, let me just share my screen. That's also kind of important. Sure. And I right. want to see if that works and if I can get back to it easily. Uh Okay, you should be able to see the intro screen of my uh, presentation, right? I think I see the desktop. Uh, one the of desktop? Ten, one of 10 desktops or, or workspace of your OS. That is not good because that means that the thing is sharing the wrong, ah, come on. Is this getting any better? Yep, that's it. I see your, uh, I see your Excellent. React.js. Yeah, that is uh, that is that is cool. Yeah, if this works, then we should be good. Uh, uh, you need sound from your slides, and when you clicked share, did you choose the audio uh, button on the share? No, I don't. Oh, uh, on that matter, I do wanna. Um, can you check if you can hear this? I think it should be good because the microphone set up properly now. If I show this to the camera and then turn it on, you should be able to hear the the theme. Yep. I hear it. Yep. Excellent. Awesome. You're giving away okay. the good stuff. <laughs> oh, ah, crap. We're live already. We are, <laughs> For God. <yeah>. Okay, everyone, <laughs> please forget this. <laughs> the jury will disregard. Yeah. Um, all <laughs> right. So I'm going to stop your screen sharing, or do you think we're all good now? Um, yeah, I think we're all good now. I should also be able to stop it myself. Give sure. me a sec here. Uh, that is the wrong way. Up I on the top of the it. screen in the middle, there should be a button that says stop sharing. Uh, I can see, oh, ah, this is way better. Now it's a nice There button. you go. Okay. All right, right, so we're gonna be back in about 90 seconds. Does that work for you? Sure. Great.
Okay, everybody, welcome back. Um, let's see if we can get through a talk without mentioning turtles this time. Or maybe we've mentioned turtles. It's okay. Um, our next speaker is well known to the Hackaday community, uh, having presented at every con we've had so far. If you're, you were lucky enough to attend the 2019 card uh, con, the uh, conference badge that everyone got to play with was his design. Uh, today, he's going to take us on a journey beneath the plastic blob uh, covering a chip on board device and show us just how hard reverse engineering an unknown chip can be. You probably know him better as Sprite TM, but please welcome Joran Domberg. So, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I think everything should be set up now. Okay, thank you, Dan, for this great introduction. Um, yeah, uh, so what we're going to do today is look at the mysteries of this particular piece of tat. Um, this is, uh, well, we call it a Buddha flower. It's actually a meditation aid um, that you can buy on the internet in order to help you meditate. And uh, what it does, it actually, if you turn it on, there's electronics inside. Obviously, <laughs> there's electronics inside. Um, it, 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 um, uh, uh, it plays music, it plays Buddhist chants, uh, both to help you meditate as well as something that here in China you can put next to uh, when someone has died. Um, you have effectively an automated prayer machine. And um, the, uh, let's see if I can get to my presentation. Sorry, it's still early here. I'm very not in a multitasking mood. <laughs> Okay, um, so uh, obviously the question is how did I, why did I get such an obvious piece of tat that is of uh, a religion that I'm not even like in a member of? Well, um, it all started with uh, the, um, uh, the, the YouTube uh, channel biglife.com. You probably all know it and if not go oh, and if not go and watch it. Um, and he had uh, this, this Buddha flower. He got it off AliExpress or something. And um, he was interested in what makes it tick. And uh, so he opened it up. And uh, what's in there is effectively a little PCB uh, that runs uh, the entire show. And obviously, there's also uh, a bunch of LEDs and a speaker in there. But the most important part is this, this little PCB. <laughs> so um, what's actually on the PCB is a, uh, um, a two megabyte uh, SPI flash chip, uh, which is just a jelly bean part. And probably the songs are in there, we assume. And the other thing is a so-called blob, uh, a chip on board, a bare piece of silicon that has been bonded to uh, the board and uh, is, uh, uh, you know, people put some epoxy over it and they call it a day. However, that flash chip is interesting because that is very common and you can dump that and you can reprogram that. So the question he asked was effectively, uh, would it be possible to replace the songs uh, on, this, on this flower for something uh, a bit more, um, uh, you know, Western maybe? So obviously the entire comment section of the YouTube uh, video immediately went uh, to, to look at it. Um, so I, so uh, the, oh, my presentation is not doing what I wanted to do. Hello, what are you up to? My keyboard is running away from me. I have no idea what that was, sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, we got a file called buddha.bin, uh, which is two megabytes exactly. Um, and uh, obviously everyone ran the usual suspects uh, uh, on it when it comes to uh, inspecting what a file, what firmware does. So you start off with the Unix program file, which happily tells me it's data. Thank you, Captain Obvious. Uh, Binwalk, which is usually very good at finding stuff, finds absolutely nothing. And even strings can't really find anything human readable in the uh, binary. So Binwalk has an entropy view, which effectively tells you over the, the, uh, the size of the file how random it is. And if it's more random, it either means that stuff is encrypted or stuff is compressed. You, you unfortunately can't really see the difference between the two. And what you see here is that most of the time, um, the entropy is very high. So it's either compressed or encrypted. There's only a few tiny little blips where the, um, uh, where the line goes up uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, to a level that is not like very close to one. 
So obviously with all automated tools uh, failing, we still have uh, one remaining tool and that is to just look at the hex data. And what we see here also doesn't quite make sense. I mean, you can see that there's some pattern to it, um, but if you look at the hex values, there's not really anything in there that seems to stand out. And a little bit later in the other low entropy section, there's, there's more of the same. You can see it repeats, but what all these individual things mean, it doesn't really seem to, to, to make any sense. And even later in the large um, high entropy section, it just becomes gobbledygook and there's no pattern that, that we could discern in there. So, you know, sometimes you just have to stare at these things for long enough and, and just simply hope for enlightenment. And if you do that on this code, you can kind of slowly start seeing something there's there's a certain pattern that is emerging you can see the pattern but there's nothing really that stands out you know i think this is something this is shitty encryption okay so i need to qualify that what is shitty encryption well um there are certain levels of encryption you've got your old standard aes encryption for instance and all the other proven and reliable uh, and tested encryption methods and these are effectively, if well implemented, these are uh, bulletproof. Uh, as in, you put in a key, you put in a short string, you AES encrypt that, and you get gobbledygook, and without the proper key, you'll never get that string back. However, you can also uh, implement it badly. There's a very famous image of a picture that is encrypted using this method. And you probably can't tell what this picture originally was because the encryption uh, you know, makes it into gobbledygook, right? right? Anyway, um, then you have encryption that people just made up. Like you had a programmer and they were like, oh, this sounds like a few very good routines. And if I, if I run this on my code, then no one can ever figure out what it is. So this, this is what that would look like. You take hello, uh, you decrease all the bits by one, uh, you flip all the bits, you, you, bit, you, you bitwise invert it, and, and then you revert the, uh, reverse the entire sequence. So whatever programmer came up with that might have thought that it was a very good idea, might have even sung about it. But yeah, if you know a little bit about cryptography, you know that this can be broken pretty quickly. And finally, you have when they don't even try. This is called obfuscation. And obfuscation is effectively used if you don't want people to see immediately what it's on about, but you don't really care if they break, break the scheme or not. So um, uh, uh, another definition of, of shitty encryption, or at least where it comes from, is a very nice quote by Bruce Snyder. Anyone from the most clueless amateur to the best cryptographer can create an algorithm that they themselves can't break. And uh, this is kind of what I think happened here, maybe. Um, and in order to show how it works, uh, I got to tell a little bit about XR encryption. If you already know this, this is only going to take a few slides. So if I take the text, hello, remoticon people, and I do XR encryption with super secret uh, key materials, what effectively happens is that I take uh, every byte in the uh, original text and I XR it with the corresponding byte in the key. And what you get is, again, gobbledygook. Uh, however, if I take a different string that is changed only a little bit, it now says hello Hackaday people instead of hello Remoticon people. And I encrypt it with exact the same, exactly the same key. You actually get something interesting because uh, this works on a byte by byte basis. Uh, the first and the last bit of the encrypted data are exactly the same. The middle bit is different, obviously, because the text there is different. But the first and the last bit are the same. And uh, if I only have the plain text, I can tell that, um, you know, probably the data in those locations is exactly the same. And there's a second property. And that is if you XOR encrypt data that is all zeros, uh, your result effectively is the key. So you should make sure to never do that because you can just read the key straight out of the encrypted data stream. So too long uh, didn't read is if you XOR data with a key, you get gibberish, something that I didn't mention, but it's true is that you XOR it with the key again, you get the data back. Uh, both the data and the key uh, kind of leak into the, 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 the gibberish and uh, yeah, you should never um, try to encrypt all zeros. With that in mind, if we go back to the binaries, something interesting pops up. And if we take the other region and, and also look at that, then you know more interesting stuff pops up. And a little bit later, you get even more interesting stuff. So strangely, all these things, for instance, start with EFFF. And these are all structures. They're either 32 bits, uh, sorry, 32 bytes or 16 bytes structures that describe something. 
And the value you often get in structures like that is all zeros. So it's very likely that of these structures, a whole bunch of them start out with all zeros, which means that we now know the first two um, uh, bytes of our key stream, which is likely EFFF. So a whole bunch of us started working on that and we recovered the key stream. It's EFFF, DF, 9F, 1F, 3E, 7C, F8. Oh, this goes on forever. Yeah, this, this doesn't repeat itself. So there must be something that generates this. And we can actually figure this out pretty easily because um, if you see how the XOR um, key changes from byte to byte, you see that EF, for instance, only goes to FF. 9F only goes to one out of two values. F0 also goes only to one out of two values. There's no third option. And in general, if you look at these uh, values hard enough, you can figure out that if you have a certain uh, uh, previous uh, XOR value X, then it either becomes XOR, uh, sorry, then it either becomes the value left shifted by one or the value left shifted by one XOR with uh, 21 hexadecimal. So here's that routine in, in uh, C if you, if you if you think it's easier to read that. But the trick is that it's uh, dependent on a certain bit that is generated somewhere else. That bit decides which of the two um, values to use. And obviously, because we have the key stream, we can also look at what those bits must have been. And you get this, this range out of there. And the issue is that, again, it goes on forever. And in this particular case, there's no real pattern discernible in there. It kind of looks like random. So again, there's not much to do here with our tools. We have to just, you know, meditate on this a bit. And then you, then you start thinking like, this looks random. So first of all, it must be generated. So there must be some generator in there and it looks random, but it is repeatable. So maybe this is a pseudo random number generator, seems likely. So what kind of pseudo random number generator would you implement in a small chip? Well, it must be a linear feedback shift register. It's just about the cheapest way to implement a pseudo, pseudo random number stream. So a linear feedback shift register looks like this. Uh, the top bit is hardware. You effectively have 16 flip-flops or a, a certain amount of flip-flops and uh, they form a shift register. But every now and then there is an XOR uh, inserted that XORs uh, the value with the last uh, uh, flip-flops value. And the uh, bit under it is how you would implement it in C. So LFSRs come in a few different uh, sizes. So there's a few unknowns. We don't know the length of the LFSR, so how many flip-flops are involved. We don't know the position of the tabs, so where the XOR um, uh, gates are inserted. And we don't know what the initial state of the flip-flops are. Well, we can guess a few things. Uh, so the length of the LFSR we can guess um, is probably a, probably a multiple of eight because that's common. And it's probably not eight because that's a little bit on the low side. So that's likely 16 bit. Tap positions we don't know. So, you know, there's two to the 16 possible tap positions we need to try. The same thing is true with the start states. Uh, there's two to the 16s. So that means that we've got four, uh, four billion options to go through. And you might think like, oh, that's a lot. Uh, it's not. LFSR is really uh, small and, and quick to do. So on my five-year laptop, I can burst through that in 60 seconds, even less. So whipped up some code and that code uh, ended up being a uh, encryption brute forcer. So I now have a program that does everything described above automatically. So you feed a binary into it and it gives you the keys. So that results in effectively uh, the binary is now fully cracked and you can see stuff show up and this actually looks like a file system of sorts. And that's true, it is a file system. Um, uh, and, and this is what it normally contains. You've got a file called code.app, uh, which is a file which has its own internal segments. And then you've got a whole bunch of files called something.f1a. So the stuff in the code.app is, well, code, <laughs> as it says. And the stuff, uh, the, the F1A stuff must be audio because it's effectively uh, covering the largest part of the flash space. And there's, there's just as many in there as there's supposed to be songs in the, the thing. So we now have machine code, but what CPU is it? Well, um, uh, you actually have tools for that. And uh, CPU rack actually tells me it's an 8051. Uh, 
okay. Um, so an age of 51, I had a whole section here um, detailing the ins and outs on it. Um, I have a few opinions on it. Um, I'm not going to get into it. I don't want to make this uh, too opinionated, but so just let's, let's, let's skip over this. Uh, the truth is we do have uh, an age of 51 and we can now see the dis disassembly of those overlay uh, chunks in the code.app thing. Which is great. I mean, we, we've got code to look at. And uh, because this is in Flash, we could even, you know, uh, replace this code with something else. However, the thing is that uh, the code is unfortunately incomplete. So why is it incomplete? Well, not all the code is in Flash. Um, and there's a few reasons we can we can, uh, we can can deduce that. Well, first of all, the code at APP is only 9K of size, which seems a little bit on the small side. Um, the other thing is something needs to load the code.app. Something needs to do the decryption and uh, you know figure out where code.app is, and that that is likely some other code. And the most obvious smoking bullet is that the code.app has calls and jumps into some memory region we don't have yet. So up till now we've done everything just using the two megabyte uh, flash uh, binary dump that uh, Clive made. Um, but now it's time to actually get our own uh, Buddha flower. So I got one of Taobao, it cost me like, uh, this is the equivalent of like $7, I think. And um, yeah, I received it. It looks exactly the same as Big Clive's. Um, only mine has uh, 56 songs. Here are all of them, if you're interested. And obviously I opened it up. It looks pretty much the same internally, but the PCB is a little bit different. Um, I don't get a blob. I actually get a proper 16 pin chip. Unfortunately, the chip is not marked anywhere. So I still don't know what, what chip this is or who makes it. Well, never mind. We have something to do. We actually need to figure out what the data in the uh, unknown sections in, 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 in probably the ROM of this chip is. And we need to get it out. Well, reading it out is not that hard because we can just replace one of the overlays with something that reads out the data. But how do we get it to a PC? How do I get the binary on my hard disk? Well, that's a bit of a problem because I didn't see a UART anywhere. If I scoped around, I don't see any serial signals. There's one button GPIO there, but that's the input. And I have no idea what the chip is. So I can't turn it into an output. The, uh, I, I actually checked, uh, there's there's common um, peripherals for an A251, but this, this, this one doesn't seem to match that. So maybe the SPI, maybe if I poke around, I can just find the SPI data register and maybe that's enough. An SPI would actually work great because um, this is a quick sketch of, of, of how the thing, um, how the PCB works. So you've got the mystery chip and the flash chip and they're connected by an SPI bus. And how an SPI bus normally works is that you pull the chip select line low in order to indicate to the flash, hey, I'm gonna do something. And then you do, then you communicate it over the data and the clock lines. However, if you communicate over the data and the clock lines when chip select is high, the flash chip is effectively deaf. It'll ignore that little bit of communication. So if we can um, you know, trick the uh, mystery chip into doing that, we can just uh, you know, connect a logic analyzer to those pins and then uh, read that, that ignore data into the PC, decode it, and you know, we can communicate with our dumper. So uh, yeah, let's do that. So read all the memory. So it's very simple. We take the flash image, we unpack it, we replace one of the overlays with our dumper program that just reads the memory and, and pushes it to the SPI data register. We repack the flash, we program the flash chip, uh, we resolder it, we attach our logic analyzer, power the entire thing on, dump the SPI traffic, and you know we've got our binary, awesome. So that actually works. Um, and now we got to look at what the binary is. And luckily, um, one of the good things that the NSA has left us is Ghidra, which is an awesome uh, tool uh, for uh, reverse engineering stuff. And it also understands the 8 of 51, so we can happily uh, reverse engineer this. And this is, this is what that looks like. So you've got a nice disassembly. Ghidra also does a brave attempt to convert it into C code, given the fact that half of the code isn't even written in C. That's pretty interesting. And one of the things is we can now explore the chip a little bit more. For instance, we can, chip, we can figure out what the memory space looks like. So this is the memory space of the chip. You've got 4K of RAM here. You've got 8K of very clear, obvious ROM routines here. 
Uh, you've got a mystery re region here, which is 8K. I'll come back to that later. And uh, but let's let's first focus on the RAM. So because the um, uh, the SPI flash um, code regions are actually executed from here. And the reason I call it overlays is because they actually work like that. And uh, the way it works effectively is say overlay zero is in RAM and it wants to call a function in overlay two. What actually happens is that the compiler inserts a call into ROM instead. So overlay zero will call into ROM and ROM will uh, use the SPI peripheral to load overlay two into RAM. So it entirely overrides the calling code. It'll then jump into overlay two and just execute whatever function it is. And as soon as it returns, it returns to ROM again. And the ROM will reload overlay zero and execution will happily um, uh, continue from there. So it's a pretty interesting uh, way of doing things. But hold up, there was a region that has a big question mark. What's up with that? Well, if you go into Ghidra, you see this. Uh, Ghidra detects that there are subroutines here because there's other codes jumping to this code, but the memory region reads as all zeros. So they're trying to keep something from us. Seemingly this ROM is not re readable. So we got to make sure that we also have this because obviously we want to have access to all the code that's in this chip. So the idea of the secret ROM actually reminded me of the Game Boy Advance. It has something pretty similar. Uh, if you look at a very simplified memory subsystem structure of the Game Boy Advance, this is what it looks like. And the trick is that if you want to read the ROM memory from the cartridge, you can't. If you want to read the uh, ROM memory from RAM, you can't. Nintendo actually designed the hardware to stop you from doing that. The only thing that can read from uh, the, the ROM memory is code running in the ROM itself. So you need to run your code from the ROM in order to read the ROM. But obviously, you can't just stash your own code in ROM because it's read-only memory. So um, in order to read it, what uh, the people reverse engineering the Game Boy Advance had to do is find uh, a routine that could be abused in order to uh, read from the ROM and then return data. And Nintendo, obviously, is not a big fan of this. So for most of the um, uh, routines in ROM, they actually check if you're trying to uh, uh, do something with, a, uh, with an address that itself is in the secret ROM, and they will just return zero then except for one function. Uh, there's one function that you can actually feed a pointer into ROM and it won't check that. And it returns a certain value that you can um, uh, demangle to whatever byte was at that certain uh, uh, ROM pointer thing. So now we need to find something similar in our chip and, and obviously hope that they don't, uh, that they're smarter than, than Nintendo and do, uh, and, uh, uh, we got to hope that they're not smarter than Nintendo, uh, so they don't check every pointer uh, that goes into that. Uh, obviously, we have no idea in this case what, what the ROM functions do, so I just picked one as random. Uh, this, this is a bit of code that I do have that calls a ROM function that lives in the secret ROM. I have no idea what it does, but it looks good because you can actually see that it uh, that, that one of the arguments is a pointer into uh, the non-secret ROM. So maybe it can also do something with the secret ROM, who knows? Um, so literally first function I grabbed and I actually was lucky because uh, yes, a side effect of that, that function that's called is that the accumulator register gets filled with um, the memory at uh, the D pointer plus three bytes which is awesome because it means that I can just run that um, uh, with the D pointer pointing at the entire secret ROM range and I'll just get the secret ROM, which is great. Um, and then I had the secret ROM and I was actually curious, what does this routine do? Like what, what, what was the way that me calling this and reading the accumulator snuck past all of their de defenses? I mean, maybe they just left the, maybe they just overlooked the fact that there was a side effect that the accumulator got used and then not cleared. Well, actually, no, the function does a plain memory copy of four bytes. There's no checks at all. Uh, I could even read the ROM if I used the, uh, the, this function uh, like the way you should. So yeah, this is a great example of the hardware guys making stuff secret and then the software guys messing it up entirely. So we now have all the secret routines as well, which means that we have, to my knowledge, all the code that runs in this little chip, which is great. But unfortunately, there are still no clues to who makes this chip in there. Uh, the ROMs doesn't contain any strings or any other stuff that, that makes it very obvious. 
So, um, however, at this time, obviously, I wasn't the only person uh, who wanted to have their own Buddha flower. So someone else, uh, Neil 555, also ordered his and um, he got it and his PCB was different again. So he doesn't get a blob and he also doesn't get a nameless chip. He actually get a chip with silk screen on it. So this chip is made by a company called uh, G. Lee. Um, it is, um, if you have a cheap ass Bluetooth headset, it's very likely that their chip is in there. And obviously like the PCB is different, the chip might be different. Um, they might just have switched manufacturers and this might just be an entirely different chip. So there's actually a way to find this out because um, uh, there was a ROM dump provided of the flash uh, uh, chip in this uh, on this PCB as well. And I can just feed it into my brute forcer and my brute forcer happily found uh, the key materials and I could happily unpack this flash binary. So yes, it's exactly the same chip. So now we know which chip it is, but as you probably know, if you only have a type number and you throw that into Google, you're not likely to get results for, for obscure Chinese manufacturers. So one of the tricks you do then is um, you just take the name and you just backspace the last characters until you get a hit. And we actually did that and um, a familiar person popped up. So uh, Foon, they Twittered about this a while ago and uh, it's a chip with similar markings. The last bit doesn't match, but the first bit does. And he actually found this on a cheap MP3 player uh, PCB. And uh, he and his Twitter uh, fans did some research and it's actually um, uh, 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 something with an 8051 core. They found a data sheet and they also found a name. It's often called the AC1082. So, hey, this is a lead, you know? If this has an 8051 and it's publicly known, then maybe um, there's also an SDK out there. Uh, you tend to have these, these, these obscure websites where people just upload all sorts of uh, private stuff like SDKs and, 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 and stuff. They're, they're usually like obscure Chinese or Russian sites. So I'm like, maybe with some more Google Foo, now I know that this thing is an, eight, uh, that this thing is an AC1052, I can find something. And I actually didn't find anything, but I did find a Chinese uh, blogger who uh, posted a bunch of posts on how to work with this SDK. And uh, even if you can't read this, uh, uh, even if you can't read Chinese, you can probably uh, understand that there was some, some frustration involved there. I don't need to translate this. You probably recognize this. Um, but one of the, the, the things there was that uh, he posted a bunch of screenshots and in there it showed that the AC calls itself the SDK underscore AC109N. So I've got something new to Google uh, for. And yes, I got lucky uh, after uh, some Googling, I actually found a copy of the SDK in the, in, the, in the hive of scum and villainy on the backwards bits of the internet that's called GitHub. Yeah, it was just out there on GitHub. So great, uh, we downloaded it and um, um, uh, I'll, 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 I'll spare you the details. I'll just give you a summary. So the good parts of the SDK is that we actually found some code that matches the binary. So this is certainly in the same family of our chip. Uh, the SDK has some hardware register definitions. Uh, it also has some peripheral drivers, although they're not that useful because I squared C, yeah, I don't care about that. And it has some hardware docs. They're obviously in Chinese and they're very sparse, but they're there. So the bad thing is that we can't really make our own firmware because this uses a proprietary keel compiler. Um, it doesn't help us reverse engineer the chip that much either because most of the logic is in binary blobs that, that just get linked into your thing. Uh, the audio hardware is entirely undocumented. You're supposed to use those binary blobs to talk to it. Um, and um, unfortunately, there's also some things that I really wanted in there. So uh, first of all, I would, I would like to, I would like to, apologies, I, I would like to have some mention of the F1A format because, you know, in the end, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to encode our own F1As and, and, and replace the music in those things. This thing doesn't mention it. Uh, some peripheral registers actually seem inaccurate, even in the examples. They're writing to registers that are not supposed to be GPIOs when they write to GPIOs. I'm not entirely sure what's going on there. Um, so there's no banking or encryption info. Luckily, we don't need that. We already figured that out all by ourselves. And the peripherals don't match our chip. And that's a bit of a problem because it would be great if we could just write to peripherals um, and, and know what that was gonna do. But uh, there seems to be some sort of mismatch. It, it, 
there's 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 some overlap as well, but not everything. So the SDK and knowing that this is the family we need to look at did actually help us because someone else also did their own squirreling. Um, and um, oh yeah, so, um, yeah. So peripherals don't match the chip. Sorry, I'm looking at the preview. <laughs> um, so someone else also uh, did some squirreling and they found another project by, product by Geely, which is the AD140. And I have no idea what that is, but it does come with a tool to do audio conversion. It's in Chinese, obviously, it's Windows only, obviously. Um, but uh, the idea is that you can put a bunch of waves or MP3s or whatever in there. You select the, uh, the, the format you want to encode it into and it supports F1A and you press OK and it, it just does the thing, which is great. Uh, obviously, we also looked at what this did a little bit because we're now very curious what that F1A format is. There was a lot of speculation about ADPCM and AAC and maybe an MP3 thing. Well, actually, it turns out it's the WMA, Windows Media Audio. Who the thunk? So what happens is that uh, the thing has a pipeline that converts it to a low bitrate Windows Media Audio file, and it then strips all the me metadata of the uh, Windows Media Audio file, only keeping the bare bones data, and that's your F1A file. So that means that we now have something that can encode F1As, which means that we can replace the songs, which is absolutely great because I can um, uh, I can show you this. Uh, yeah, you should see me again. So I now have one of the Buddha machines that uh, produces something way more relaxing than Chinese chants. And I'll cut it off there before you know YouTube does content matching shenanigans. So uh, yeah, that's great. We can replace songs. Um, we uh, you know uh, um, uh, fix the encryption. Uh, we can uh, replace an F1A. We can repack and re-encrypt the thing. And yeah, uh, now now the music that's in there is all ours. Great. Now what? So. Yeah, we have um, uh, we have an encryptor and decryptor. We have an uh, uh, we, ha we have some information about the SOC, but some of it is incorrect, and we know what the F1A is. So, what can we do with that? What do we want to do with that? Well, we could make an open source encoder, but WMA is proprietary and very undocumented. There's no low bitrate open source encoder uh, out there. FFmpeg can only do high bitrate things, and we don't entirely understand the format yet. So. Eh. Maybe we should make an open source SDK, but well, you've probably seen what I think about the architecture. It would need way more reverse engineering and you can't obtain the chip anyway. So, yeah. so does that mean that, that you know, we just call it a day and we chuck away the, 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 the thing? I wasn't really feeling like that either. It's probably better to, to uh, you know, reuse it. And actually, someone uh, posted uh, uh, a few weeks before the con um, something really nice, namely a design to make your own um, uh, your own Remoticon 2 batch. And it came in the form of a KiCat uh, uh, file that you could just put your own schematics in. So I did. I replicated the schematic in the Buddha flower, added some LEDs, and and uh, you know uh, sent it off to be made. Unfortunately, it's green. I'd rather have it be in like purple or blue, but I had the choice between green or way too late for the com. So yeah, that was an easy choice. And this is what it looks like and does. So uh, you may have already seen it. This is the thing. And if you turn it on, it plays the, the theme of the Remoticon. And um, the LEDs you see there, um, they actually output the um, values that are generated by the LFSR that encrypts the, uh, that decrypts the flash. So what was one secret is now happily blinked out. Um, so that's great. And with that, with my nice memento of uh, this year's Remoticon, uh, my, uh, my talk ends. Um, I'd like to thank all the people who uh, came along in this journey. As I said, this is not something that I did. Uh, this is something that a whole bunch of people did on, on YouTube and on the uh, uh, subreddit. Uh, these are all the, the, the people that really helped. If your name is in there, I really hope to uh, do a project like this with you again. And uh, then all that remains is to thank, thank everyone to, uh, 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 for listening and for watching. 
And that was my talk. Uh, stop sharing. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the kind of stuff that got me, uh, got me interested in Hackaday in the first place all those years ago. That's exactly the kind of stuff that I used to like to, to read in, in articles and, uh, and hearing about it now in person. That was awesome. Um, it's, it, really it's really it. fun to do as well. <laughs> it, it looks like a blast. The, 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 the people here, the mistake that they made with the encryption is that they actually made it fun to, to break and they should <laughs> never do that. You're hanging, you're hanging red meat in front of, uh, in front of people <laughs> like you, when you, when you do for stuff sure. like that. Um, yeah. So, you know, everybody wants to clap, so I'll clap for you. Um, Thank you. Thanks. That was awesome. Um, we're going to take a little bit of a break going into the trivia show, I think. Um, but hang around. We're going to be right back with uh, with the uh, with the trivia show. Uh, and I guess you're probably going to be in the in the uh, discord for a bit. Um, there's, answering there, questions. there's a whole bunch of material that I had to cut out uh, to, to make it fit in, in 30 minutes. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask and I'll try to to explain there. All right. Cool. See you over in the Discord, and then we'll see everybody else uh, who wants to uh, come and compete in the trivia quiz, which will be a lot of fun. Oh, see you then. Sure. For everyone watching the live stream, this countdown is for Hacker Trivia, which is going to start in eight minutes. This stream will automatically redirect you to the Hacker Trivia stream.